The following podcast, I talk to Paul Meldrum, a Sydney-based long-time coach and business owner. We talk about artificial intelligence software that Paul is building out that really sounds like it's going to revolutionize the way we interact with how we solve problems as health problems, as health professionals um, in this industry. We talk about communication and philosophy and the way Paul communicates effectively with people who have dogmas, um, people who think their way is the only way, and how to argue for both sides of an argument, how to communicate and solve problems with people who are stuck, right? We talk about philosophy, we talk about screening, okay, screening and monitoring, solving uh, musculoskeletal uh, issues, and we talk about uh, cheat meals and people's relationship with foods and why cheat meals can be quite a ineffective, deleterious thing. And lastly, we finish off talking about Paul's new book and how to experience life that incorporates joy while still working very hard at it and still being able to balance a life that is intentive and it has intention towards productivity and working hard while experiencing a life full of joy and fun. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. I really, really loved it. There are a lot of lessons, takeaways, and profound principles contained within it. How are you doing lockdown? Man, overall, I am trying to use this opportunity, or trying to use this adversity as an opportunity, you know, trying to use it and take as much as I can with it to, to learn and to, you know, push myself to stay focused even though you could use every excuse to do the opposite so it's actually i feel a bit weird saying it sometimes but overall it's been productive it's been very productive and sometimes it's even been great like for business wise too and then the first time i heard that that talk was the athletes authority guys and i'm like oh and then i kept hearing it time and time again from other people who like are doing well like they're winning it's like yeah. oh they're using this to get better how how are you feeling how are you doing yeah, I'm, I'm doing good, man. I did the same thing. Like I was able to use um, the first week of it to transition to being fully online. Yes. And like I've maintained it since then. Uh, I was able to reduce expenses because obviously no facility rent. Um, and then set up like a home gym for when everything came, moved into a much bigger, better house. Set up a home gym for uh, more resources to train just a couple of online people, just a, a couple of in-person people just to keep the flow, keep the sword sharp, mm. and uh, yeah, teach better. Yeah. To win. When you did, when that all happened, when that all started kicking off, what was your initial response? Because everybody's thrown into, you know, a bit of chaos. How did you respond to it tactfully? Because I know you like philosophy, and you got that tattoo on you that I believe, um, uh, who is it? There's a Greek philosopher, I believe. That one in Cora and Pyro? Yes. Uh, Michelangelo before he died. Ah, Michelangelo. Okay. So, yeah, how did you respond to all that? Because, you know, you got to, for those who don't know, like you have a pretty well-established personal training business. So you have a lot of clients and a lot of overheads, things to manage. Yeah, well, we actually, um, we're recording now, aren't we? Yeah, we're good. We're straight into it. Yeah, good. Straight in. Uh, well, it was about a year and a half ago, I shut down DC Health Performance, maybe a bit longer, uh, for a number of different reasons. But uh, what happened since then like before COVID happened i was operating in a commercial facility and just it was an expensive commercial facility but the thing with that was it was just more like a time of figuring out where my direction was going to go whether i was going to go down more the you know, ed education pathway i'm doing some work in artificial intelligence and uh really advanced computing stuff now yeah for program pro using artificial intelligence program designing program design decisions okay. which is some very different, but also makes a lot of sense with the like, program design is essentially a logical decision which you can put into a decision tree type algorithm and you can apply that to a computer to make those decisions for you on the fly mm -hmm. and then also based on the client's real-time feedback. So you can basically affect so many more people without having to be there for all those people to make that decision. 
So what we make in terms of what we do as coaches with our decision making process, there's tons of different considerations we make for everything, right? We make tons of considerations to basically create our mind map to when we make our decisions. We can put that into an algorithm to do the most of it. And then the coaching can be the coaching can focus purely on the moment. Anyway, that's a digression that I'm sure we'll yeah, yeah, dive back. I would definitely yeah. want to cover Although that. Although look to with the COVID stuff, you know, it was March twenty three, we got locked down in New South Wales. I'm not sure if it was the same throughout Australia. Um, what they did, I was like, I wasn't super happy where I was. It wasn't an environment where, uh, where I was at, where I could, I am still learning. It just mm -hmm. wasn't happening. It was certainly not uh, an intellectually stimulating place to be in or also an ethically sound place in terms of what was happening with the facility. So at that time, I kind of decided as soon as the Sunday night, I remember being, oh shit, what do I do? Like, mm. what's gonna happen? Uh, by Monday, by about 12 o'clock, I was like, cool, I'm just going to transition everyone to online. And this is the path I'm going to go. I'm going to go chase this online, chase this artificial intelligence, chase the education pathway. And I'm just going to do it 100%. I don't yeah. care. And due to circumstance and luck, I was able to, and due to some decisions that other people made, I was able to get out of that commercial agreement, which was fantastic. Um, it was quite easy to do. That took a little bit of deliberation and reflection to decide if I was actually going to then go through and have the courage to follow that, mm. which I did, thankfully. And um, from there, it was kind of like, all right, cool. There's no other option. That's what I'm doing. You uh, you burnt your boats and you went to war. I, I, I jumped on the, jumped off the boat, got on the shore, burnt the boat, left it there, haven't looked back since. Really? That's awesome. Yeah. How has it been? I mean, because now is it, it's solely online clientele for you right now that's the future ed online education online services um do you do in-person stuff anymore i maybe see one to two people a day in real life and i think just in your home environment just at home because i got a home gym home, nice. home. i've got a gym office and a treatment room so i can nice. kind of still keep my skills developed in all those different uh frameworks but i it's interesting. I was actually discussing the other day with my wife. I was like, man, I'm, I walked into Athletes Authority of all, of all places to pick up some um, uh, some Goliath plates from them that they were getting rid of. I was like, cool, I'll get some more weights. Mm. Uh, I was think, looking at the vibe and I was like, man, I missed that. Yeah. The vibe is sick. Culture. Like they had about, I think it would have been, it was nine, nine o'clock. They had like 30 athletes going, music pumping. I was like, this is cool. Yeah. Um, and there was that little bit of a, you know, you feel a bit sad. You're like, oh, I used to have that with, in the past. I've let that all go down, that general regret that you get. Mm. But I was able to go, all right, cool. No, this is still the path that I want to go down. So in terms of being online, but I, I will probably always keep a little bit of in-person interaction uh, just because, hey, you go crazy. Yeah. Um, I go a little bit crazy. And I find that when I work in person with people, I can then solidify the theoretical concepts that I yes. will put together by myself. And then I can actually go, all right, cool, this is a real human being here. Yeah. It worked or I, it didn't work. I think that's a really important point because we, in a lot of fields, a lot of fields where they have a heavy theory basis, which human science does, you can get stuck in the minutia of the details of the research of, oh, new study here, new study. Like there are thousands of papers study, uh, published. I think it's hundreds of thousands each month. It's, it's a huge number. Right, you can get stuck there, and I think it's even relevant to artificial intelligence because that is, well, I mean, you can tell me, but that seems like a very theory-based uh, industry, right? A lot mm -hmm. of people who maybe aren't in tune as much with, you know, what's theoretical isn't always practical. How do you marry those two? How do you like uh, interact with those two? It's a very challenging process. So with the company that I'm working with, what the process will be is. I've created a decision tree algorithm screening process for program design situations. Okay. So, um, imagine the FMS, but jacked up on a ton of steroids, basically. And we have an actual logical outcome to why. So everything has to go to the why it has, so you can create a lot more of a laser focus on a solution. But what I have to do when I get the developers to put all these different decisions into, into a program is then I have to go into a real life gym I have to sit there and I have to watch it happen in real time to see how it works. 
So there's, I can put all the, like I've created these charts where it's just like, I think it took something like 80 different decisions to get to one damn exercise. Like it was ridiculous amount of decisions had to be made. And that's something that I would do um, intuitively from working with clients for the yeah. past 17 years. Uh, I then need to, to see the artificial, if my theoretical idea transcribes into the real world, I have to then go sit down in the gym, give the software, give the tool to someone who's never used it before, give them a base level of training, and then sit there and watch and see all the things screw up as a result of that. <laughs> And then break that down again. Figure out where's the screw up. Where's the where's that breakdown in you know data, idea, execution, and then solve that. Go back again, do the same thing. So we're transcribing like this theoretical idea to the real world. The theoretical idea is like where most of the time is spent, but the value is spent from applying it to the real world, and then going back to change your theories. Okay, so practically speaking, this algorithm or this artificial intelligence network that you're building is for what purpose is it to pre- is it to make the problem solving of musculoskeletal health ailments more efficient and screen people through this system making people not redundant but at least initially redundant so then you can enter after that initial layer has been established that's a that's a nice way of putting it. Yeah, <laughs> when I put it together the first time, when I first looked at it and how all the decisions were made, made, I was like, man, I'm eliminating ninety percent of PT's jobs. I feel like a dick. No, no, but it's good. It's that, no, yeah, go ahead. It's it's not that at all. Like artificial intelligence has been used in medicine now to help improve diagnostic criteria. Yeah, artificial intelligence is used like for a number of things to help us make better decisions based on the data and filter it in a way which we can't do because we don't have the computational power. And we also don't have the willpower. A computer will work 24 hours a day, mm. but we need to go to bed. So initially, it's not going to be for musculoskeletal ailments. It'll be for choosing a, creating an exercise program that's suitable for what that client can do at that point in time relative to their own needs, weaknesses, and things they have to do. From there, uh, as the data accumulates, because it's kind of like, you know uber for example uber does make a profit uber's worth millions and millions of dollars but it doesn't make a profit any year it's because of a data collection uber collects a ton of data on every person that comes in all these companies don't spotify doesn't make any money it just collects data on people's listening habits don't they sell the data though yeah they do sell it right. and that's where the money is or even just have big companies will pay their money just to get that data yeah just to own that data and then they can do what they want yeah um with the collection of data from all these people doing it and then adding new technologies in like um, velocity-based training, video analysis and joint talk analysis from video, it will then move into the whole injury musculoskeletal health realm. So it's kind of, it's a little bit of a um, insurance slash scope of practice nightmare initially, like dealing with doing musculoskeletal injury stuff. Like as a PT, um, you know that we don't, we're not really meant to deal with injuries, but everyone does. Mm. It's like you, you got no choice. Ninety percent of people are injured. Like, well, we manage them, but we don't technically diagnose them. No, right? we don't diagnose. So this will be to help people still maintain the training effect despite their injuries. Probably do the stuff that they need to do to get on top of their injuries, and then start to integrate into allied health professionals. So the software will go towards the allied health field. So then it will help them in the assistance of diagnosis of injuries, uh, likelihood of recurrence likelihood of chronic pain syndromes um, and how to then manage all that effectively to hopefully reduce people who are injured getting misdiagnosed and then becoming chronic cases because in terms of expenses to the economy that's just yeah. horrendous huge so it sounds yeah. like you're creating like a it's going to be eventually like if all goes well like a model that you can predict uh, based on characteristics that you like data you get the data you develop uh, commonalities and you develop like um, ratios and percentages of like likelihood and then yep. from there you'd be able to make predictions right yes that do you can you show this is this something you can demonstrate do you have like a piece of paper or share screen that you can do that just to see like what this looks like I deleted the software I think I deleted one part let me g- give me two minutes um, yeah. I can't see you right now but you can probably still see me yeah yeah I still got you uh, what's it called because 
I'll, I'll talk while you keep going because like what I'm hearing right is a ver- sounds like a very ambitious uh, task which is awesome but also something that can be hugely lucrative not just from a financially perspective but a problem solving perspective to be able to essentially well you can solve a lot of problems yeah hopefully yeah um, all right cool let's have a quick look here I think I found it all right, so this is like a very basic level one thing. So I'm going to go screen share now. Where are you? Bottom. Share screen. Oh, you disabled my screen sharing. Uh, well, How dare you? <laughs> That's a default thing. Uh, let me do that. Uh, where do I go? I've done this before. Share screen. Boom. All right, cool. All right, let's go back into that. So this is like one of the basic earlier ones because there are some... IP issues. With yeah. It. So if we need to blur anything, you just tell me. No, this is fine. All right. So this is like the basic day one level one process, right? You know, you would know this one from the FMS uh, Active Straight Leg Race screen. Let's talk through for the people just listening on um, podcast as well. You don't know what it is. Yeah. You can't see the visual yet. Just cool. for so what the um, Active Straight Leg Race is. It's the first test of the functional movement screen done by Greg Cook and Lee Burton, where it's used to. Well, the FMS started off as an injury prevention tool, found out it wasn't really the thing. Then they used it for um, screening if athletes were okay to train. Uh, I've used it and modified it quite extensively to be used as a program decision tool. So if someone's active straight leg raise is like woeful, which is basically how high they can lift their leg, I'm not going to get them doing deadlifts from the floor. That's a very, very basic uh, description of it. So I still use, this is basic level one. So active straight leg raise, if they've got a really good score, which means they've got perfect mobility, it will put them into the normal programming algorithm for any hip hinge type exercise. Okay. Really basic. Wow. Level two, because means that's generally there, still okay. It will depend on training history into what type of programming decision they made. Like a lot of people in the functional movement screen world or functional rehabilitation world still say, I'll oh, start people from the beginning. It, well, someone's got a score of two and they've deadlifted 240 kilos, get them deadlifting. Really basic stuff. Does right? that mean from that branch though, there's going to be like half a dozen other branches? Yeah, this is these are like really basic branches because normal programming could go into is their goal hypertrophy, is their goal uh, fat loss, is their goal strength, is it athletic performance, is it a soccer player, is it a football player, is it the con- the branches branch out really quickly. This is just first day, first stage. So we follow the purple line down, and this goes into a score one. So score one basically means the movement's not competent enough. And then you can see how the branches wow. are starting to, to pour out now. So the factors that could affect this are passive hamstring length, which is an easy way of me saying there's too much neuromuscular tension in the hamstrings, for example. Uh, hip flexion, inability, passive hip flexion, trunk flexion, timing patterns, um, prone hip extension, or combinations thereof. So they've wow. got... The client could have this issue, passive, ha- passive hamstring length, hip flexion, core function. Cool, an exercise that addresses all that would be a leg lowering drill and dead bug combination. Uh, there's ton- like hip, fl- they had lack of hip flexion and lack of trunk flexion. You could do a banded dead bug exercise and that would address both those concerns. That's basically what will happen is the trainer will do all those tests, all those different screens, and they'll just go tick, tick, tick. And the software will basically identify all the commonalities in that and pick what will address most things for the most bang for your buck. And then from each of those different exercises, it will then go into the performance exercise criteria. So if they're an athletic client, if it's a hypertrophy client, which way that should go, if it's a general population fat loss client, whichever way that will go. So it's very, like this is basic decision-making level 1A, mm. but this process basically eliminates the trainer having all the coach to do that entire process. Wow. But what it also does, it then takes into account like orthopedics, orthopedics like say someone's in pain, like cool, we got compression testing. If say they had pain on just putting some lumbar compression in, like it will automatically rule out things like Jefferson curls, it will roll, mm. rule out front squats, back squats, for the duration of that program until that box has been ticked again. So it basically reduces the list of available options every single time until it narrows down to what the person has to do. If it's like sciatic testing, if it's bilateral, unilateral, it'll eliminate another exercise. If we see 
compression testing here, it'll go down and check out sternocostal angles, and then it can change, it'll even change the breathing strategies used for each corrective strategy or performance strategy we'll be using for that client. So as you can see, there's a lot, this is like, it also tells you when to refer out and all different stuff like that as well. So the software for a track for a coach will be like, all right, cool. You've done this. You found this. Here's a red flag that you may not have been aware of. Right. Let's refer out to an allied health professional. Cause sometimes someone can have pain in active leg raise just from the, just the freaking tight man. Yeah. <laughs> they just, or they're not used to the movement. Um, we can use this to find out red flags, but what will happen say here. So say we get the compression testing. Cool. Uh, we've, we've eliminated a bunch of exercises there. We've got the criteria there. They've still got pain. We refer out to a um, physiotherapist. What will happen on that person's app, on their software program that they have, depending on where they are in their process or how long they've had the pain for, it will put them into a, I can't remember the name of the screen, but it's basically a questionnaire that they fill in data to determine their likelihood of becoming a chronic pain patient. Wow. So yeah. the client then has an opportunity, but we basically can red flag people for finding out, all right, cool. Are they going to, do they need to go to see an allied health professional and get themselves sorted out? Yeah. Do, can we flag the allied healthcare professional and the, the gym owner, the gym provider, the PT, whoever it is, that this person's a chronic, chronic pain patient? Do we need to then integrate, say, a chronic pain program with that person or deliver some chronic pain education, which can be delivered through the platform itself? Whoa. This is... I'm glad that someone had said what. I'm very excited. Oh, I'm thinking like... Like, my brain's going all over the place. Like, I'm even thinking like, well, okay. Say, for example, let's talk... Oh, so many places to go. Let's talk uh, genetics. There's like genetic testing, right? And that probably has a similar, oh, even more um, comprehensive algorithm tree of predictions, okay? And we're starting to do this. But the question is like, ooh... Insurance companies, if they ask for this, what's the, you know, what's the gray area here, right? Could if you if the insurance company knows that my genetics, like I have a pretty APO APOE four gene, which gives me a I think believe it's a two to three times two to four times likelihood increase of Alzheimer's dementia, right? Yeah. Then how could they change my insurance um, profile? Now let's talk about this. Say, for example, private health insurance. How could this integrate into private health insurance models based on um, predictions of health from screenings? Cool. So what we've, um, we've that's something that we've already started addressing in the software. Uh, we haven't gone down the genetic uh, pathway yet because of privacy concerns yeah. in terms of people's data. We've addressed it in terms of behaviors and what we know are known ways to lower risk. So, and the cool thing is that technology also, because everyone has a damn Fitbit, everyone has an Apple Watch, everyone has everything now, um, allows us a tool to kind of deliver that. So the, the goal is, so we have client A uh, come in with the APO4E gene or whatever it is, we can't really do anything with that right now. But the client, they've come in, they've, they're overweight, they've got an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, we've got their medical, their blood test, all that kind of stuff if their premium can go down, if they show that they have executed high quality health behaviors to help improve that. So say you achieve the standard 150 minutes a week low intensity cardio exercise, as an example. We've already had discussion, preliminary discussions to be able to go, all right, cool, that's gonna reduce someone's premium because they're taking proactive steps to improve their health. Wait, you've already had preliminary discussions with insurance companies? Yeah, the, not me, myself, but the other person has. the person, One of the founders of the company, and we're looking at uh, bringing on some public health people in about a year or two when we've got all the data to be able to do this. I did not anticipate to, to, to discover this creative, amazing tool that you are building. How long has this been a part of your life that you've been working on this project? <laughs> this is quite amusing. Um, so this is like, I originally came up with this this screen here, um, a little bit simpler, about nine years ago at DC Health yeah. uh, one day. Uh, this is, remember when the Bulletproof guy just gave out R-spray? I'm going to call him R-spray. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and um, 
he yeah. and like everyone was having bulletproof coffee and there was yeah oh yeah one. yeah yeah so i bought some modafinil because i was like yeah why not i'll try it out and like for the first two days it worked like i was like pumping i was like this is great this is good stuff um third day i nearly died but that's another story um i literally went because i was thinking about the movement screening i was thinking about our assessment process with the clients and i'm just like you know what this is shit. it doesn't tell you anything it just says oh they're a one who cares i don't yeah. care why someone's a one i want to care why they're a one it's always why i'm always caring why something's happened occurred. so i basically go on the whiteboard and i drew up something pretty much exactly like this not as detailed and without thinking of the future um, process for it, but I designed it. It took me about maybe 30 minutes to do in like a little flurry of inspiration. And then I, um, and it's been part of what I've been teaching as my mentoring like ever since. Wow. But how do you teach it as part of your mentoring? I mean, the system of it, like as a coach, that they, how they can problem solve um, based off screenings. Is that, is that what you mean? Yeah. That's why I do I teach like I teach uh, so the FMS had seven screens I reduced it down to four because mm -hmm. three were asinine but uh, inline lunge if you're not going to train it like that why test it it's stupid um, in my opinion no no, no go uh, keep, what are the three I could be wrong what are the, as, what are the asinine ones because they teach them in universities so thousands and thousands and they've taught it to me thousands of students are coming out thinking alright cool I'm going to use these these are good that was technically four asinine ones okay. active straight leg raise is just a basic like it's it's not bad shoulder mobility is not bad but mobility doesn't like it like, doesn't clear thoracic mechanics doesn't clear scapular humeral rhythm doesn't clear a bunch of stuff so it's a good overall indicator to tell you that you may need to clear other stuff that's how i look at it my connection's a bit unstable yeah. but we'll be okay um so active straight leg, leg shoulder mobility i'm happy with that uh trendelenburg or single leg stance Stepping over the string and back is a very specific motor skill. Yeah, It's very specific. So it's kind of like no one knows how to do it. And the whole point of the FMS is not to show someone how to do something. So you're not showing someone and then expecting them to execute a skill that they've never seen before, which is very specific, stepping over a string that's a height, the tibial plateau, and then pop back without struggling. It sets people up for failure. So it's stupid. Um, but standing on one leg is something that we all do and some, standing on one leg is how we will train particularly like stuff that you guys do down at, you still with Woodford? Yep. Yep, you guys do a lot of single leg work like AA do a ton of single leg work and lots of step ups. Yeah, it's useful. It's a good idea to see how it is unloaded but you don't need to step over a string. Um, the core stability test, rotary stability like it's just, I don't understand. Um, I just, I like same arm, same leg. First of all, when are you going to load up like that? It's disrespected. It's irrespective of gait mechanics. It's yeah, irrespective it's of ground -based mechanisms. Or, it's or bilateral. If you see someone, you see someone do a uh, same side sprint drill. So I did sprint workshop on Friday with Roger Fabry, who's awesome sprint coach, right? Um, we watched the, he watched someone do a same side like a skip type drill where they didn't have the coordination. He told them they were an idiot and they needed to go home. Like, why would you? test someone in an environment where they're never going to perform it like that. And he actually said that? Yeah, he sent them home. <laughs> he's like, Wait, he, home. he didn't look at them actually sprint? Oh, he saw them do the A skip, same side inside leg. He's like, shut up, you need to go. Oh, wow. He was, he was very funny. I enjoyed it. It was just a three-hour workshop where he was trying to be a bit funny. Okay. But um, he would have worked with them separately. He was just seeing how people were and then assessing the good people, then coming back to them, then we re-educate. Um, so the trunk stability test, like... I can't, I've seen no data for it at any point in terms of it actually indicating anything with rotary stability. So cool, we don't need to do that. We can kind of flop that out. Um, next one, inline lunge. When the hell are you gonna do that? Like holding a stick behind your back in this awkward pattern. It's kind of like, it's one of those tests where it's set up for you to fail. Like if you fail shoulder mobility in that, you're gonna fail the inline lunge because you can't hold the damn stick. Mm. So first of all, you've set yourself up, it's, it's a double negative. It's put into place somewhere where someone who's already failed before is now going to fail at something else, even though they might be awesome at doing lunges. And it's also not a lunge because a lunge indicates going forward. That's a, uh, a split squat. Yeah, it's a split squat. Yeah, exactly. So it's not testing the same thing. So I don't think you need to do it. And if someone fails standing on one leg, they're probably not going to be able to do good walking lunges anyway. 
Mm. So you kind of create a programming redundancy. If it doesn't change how I would program for someone, why am I going to assess it? Because that's a great point. I'm, that that is the point. Because inline, okay, inline line just it's going to tell me something. I'm going to play a little devs advocate. Okay, maybe maybe it's going to help me a little bit with <laughs> with single load balance coordination. Um, how how motor control out of the bottom position, but okay, it's not the same pattern. So why don't we just do the pattern squat, yeah, overhead exactly. press, it's pull, what? push, um, walking lunge, single leg RDL, things like uh, Jordan Shallow. Uh, I really like his um, stability and mobility assessments. Oh, the muscle doc. Yeah, I met him on um, Thursday. Actually, he's cool. Wait, he's in Melbourne. I mean, he, Sydney. Oh, he's in Sydney. Sydney. Yeah, he was, he's been stuck here since um, March. Has he? Because what? COVID. He was stuck because of COVID. Oh, that's hilarious. He can't go back home. He flew back yesterday, I think. Oh, my God. Yeah, yesterday. He was training in City Gym, and then he flew back after that. Hey, it's a great place to get stuck. I didn't know that. So uh, what was yeah. your experience with him? Because those who don't know, he's uh, probably one of the foremost, smartest um, physical therapists under... Th- is he th- under 30? I don't know. I think so, yeah. Jesus. He, first thing, well, I just he, I saw him in the gym. I was, doing a, I was filming uh, two seminars for Level Up Continuing Education in there. So I filmed them, went downstairs, I was holding the camera guy's gears, he went and got his car, and I just saw Jordan pumping some weights out. And I was like, oh, well, you don't see that every day. Um, <laughs> this huge dude with a huge beard. And I was like, all right, cool, I'll, go say, I'll say hi to him, just say, hey, you do some good stuff on Instagram, thank you. Yeah. Because um, it's always, for people who are, to get that kind of feedback, it's always nice, right? It's never a bad sure. thing to do. So I went up to him and said, hey, man, Jordan? And he's like, yeah, yeah. And it's like, and following Instagram, big fan of your stuff. You do some really cool work. Thanks heaps. And he's he was really appreciative of it. And he's like, oh, thanks, man. And then he comes up to me, finishes his workout, comes up to me. He's like, hey, man, what's your name? And he goes to shake my hand, which led to me freaking out. <laughs> like, who shakes hands? My God. Right. <laughs> anyway, it was cool. Did you shake his hand? Like, his hand's like a steak. Oh, yeah, I shook it. His whole body's like a steak. He's so big. And, um, shook his hand. He just like uh, chatted for about 10, 15 minutes. It's like just sharing more stories about teaching and stuff. And then he, um, he's like, hey, man, you're going to be see Jim tomorrow? What time? And I'm like, oh, okay, I'll be here about one. He's like, oh, cool, send me a message and oh, I'll let you know. What a good guy. Like, you know, and he, I said, All right, cool, I'll be there at that time. Send a message, he replied. And then when he saw me, he comes up to me and talks to me again. Like he's probably one of the most genuine, humble, down-to-earth people I've met in the fitness industry. That is I'm so glad to hear that because sometimes like you meet your quote unquote heroes, you meet these people and they turn out to be just not good people. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, not nice people. Right. Yeah. But he's really genuine down there. He is exactly who he is. That's he's awesome. Good. good for hey, yeah. shout out to, to Jordan Shallow, you know, who's yeah, he not watching be. this right now, but good for yeah. him. That's awesome. He's not playing. <laughs> but yeah, so back to the FMS, like yeah. inline lunge, yet to get some data but wasn't changing my programming decision, so see you later. Overhead squat. First of all, there's a built-in redundancy. If someone's shoulder mobility is average, they're not going to do an overhead squat. It ain't going to happen. It's already uh, They've already failed because the virtue of not being able to hold their arms up, they're not going to do it. Keeping the feet straight ahead. No. Right. <laughs> because it's not how you train it <laughs> ever. It's not how the architecture of the hip joint works. Yeah. It's just like, all right, cool. So I'm setting up people to fail, first of all, from a from an overhead mobility perspective if they've already failed something and i'm setting someone up to fail just by the virtue of their hip the actual bony structures of their hip so one of my staff members sean sean kelly he was i trained him for ages he was a pretty decent weight lifter like at 74 kilos he was clean jerking 145. so it's not bad right? Not bad. 110 kit. He snap. He snatched his bear from a deficit than it was from the ground, which was weird. And he got 115 from a deficit, like odd kid. But he would like you assume if he's doing that and the same way he squatted 200, he's a good squatter, right? He'd fail the FMS every single time with Paddy's feet straight ahead. There you go. So and and like, they would look at that and say, "Hey, well, you can't squat or you can't do this or do that. You're okay. you're not adequate. You're not competent." Yeah, and then he's like, uh, he's squatting, um, he squatted 200 kilos. Right. Like, no, like, you can't get much. We'll stop that for a bit. Just out my data. Um, like, he couldn't get better than that. So, 
at that point, I was like, all right, cool. Well, that's, we're just going to get rid of the overhead squat component because, again, in my context, like with general population, that is an inferior screening process, whereas a normal squat, and then seeing how someone just can do a back squat or a front squat or a goblet squat yeah. is a better screen because it's relative to their training process. Like, you work with athletes in a whole bunch of different sports, right? Yeah. Like, if you're working with – I know you've got personal history of basketball as well. How many basketball players can do an overhead squat? Particularly if they get over six foot two. <laughs> Man, uh, ha, ha, almost all basketballers would fail almost all of those tests. Yeah, right? exactly. Not just the sport. NFL players, they'd fail all of those tests too. Yet they'd kick her out, or they might not kick your butt on the court, but they'd kick most of our butts on the court. Right. Um, so even like for athletes doing overhead squat, like it's funny, we're like just thinking about the FMS and the stuff we, we're told. We get told by so many coaches that full range Olympic lifting is a waste of time, right? For athletes, because not because the lifts are inherently bad in and of themselves, it's because their learning curve is so high. Correct. So, you know, like clean, like you still do power clean, still do, you can do close grip, high snatches, tons of different options there. Why are we using Olympic lifting derivative to test someone for something we're never going to use? Right. Overhead right. squat is an Olympic lifting der- derivative. Great right point. It's it, a contradiction. Yeah, it's a bottom position of a snatch. Yeah. Uh, but we're never going to teach a snatch. So why the hell would we do this? So basically what I did, I was like, all right, cool. Let's eliminate all these tests because they're not influencing my programming decisions. And that was kind of like a very delayed follow on of being a check practitioner mm. many years ago where you orthopedically assess everything and clear every chakra for everything. <laughs> I like I got rid of all that stuff because it wasn't influencing my programming decisions. Then I just went into a new assessment protocol, which was just doing the same stuff just it seemed cooler because i had the fms on the name so then i was like all right cool what are the contributing factors to each of these problems being a thing okay so active straight leg raise well could someone have excessive tension in the hamstrings yes could uh could poor glute function on the opposite leg inhibit that yes like meaning weak glutes or a d- slightly delayed firing pattern even though we, like we can get into the verbiage of firing patterns etc but it's could someone having crap worse, weaker glutes in their hamstrings be a problem? Yes. Uh, core function, could them having some core weakness issues affect that pattern? Yes. Breathing? Yes. All right, cool. These are all the things. How do we assess that? Okay. These are the tests that we're going to use. Let's, let's find someone who's got a shitty pattern and let's do these five tests. So that's what we did. We found a bunch of, that day, I found, I think it was a staff member who had a crappy leg raise. We assessed, it was her, yes, we assessed her. And we went through all those different tests and we said, oh, this is, you've got crappy, this, this is, this needs to be improved. Let's do the corrective strategy for that. We did that corrective strategy, two sets. The score went from a one to a three. And we're like, hmm, we've been missing something for a long damn time. Mm. So we basically then broke down each of the uh, other screens that we decided to keep and figured out, okay, what are all the contributing factors at each individual joint level or neuromuscular control, let's assess this, let's figure out what corrective strategies work for those particular demands, implement. And like this, that's what I've been teaching since, well, 2013 maybe. Like I even did a seminar for Level Up, Continuing Education's Level One course maybe, we've been five weeks ago, and this kid came up and uh, it's great because I got on video, which makes it even cooler. But he came up, he could barely lift his leg like literally 20 degrees off the ground. We went through, I had Sean, he was assisting me do the screening process. He, I was just talking smack the whole time while it was happening to the camera. And the guy had a problem, I think it was trunk flexion and um, hip flexion, he had a hip flexion deficit. So what we did, Sean just gave him a banded dead bug type exercise. He did 10 reps while I was talking and 90 degrees. That's it. Leg went from 20 to 90 degrees, 10 repetitions. The whole, even the cameraman went, oh shit, how that happened, which is really cool. Um, but what I then had to teach a group, and this is why I teach my mentoring students as well, is once you've done that, it doesn't mean, just because you've created a transient change doesn't mean you've created a permanent change. Exactly. So you need to then get that kid's butt in the weight room, load him up with some proper Romanian deadlift type patterns and proper hip hinging type work and make him strong in his newfound range of motion. So once you create an opportunity by modulating someone's nervous system, getting rid of tension, building tension where they need it, mm-hmm. you then need to transfer that to something useful. Absolutely. 
otherwise you've just done like some intellectual masturbation process which isn't <laughs> it looks cool but unless you actually load it and lengthen it like that lengthen it under load you will not sustain it that point you just made i think is so important and so applicable it's applicable to like all uh how do i say all tools where you try and address a dysfunction and especially things like tissue release work like i used to think that the foam rolling and tissue release and the rolling out and ball something that almost everybody who exercises does yep. creates more permanent changes i thought that it was changing like the viscoelastic properties and maybe it does somehow and we don't know yet of the tissue and fashion maybe you can explain maybe it does but when you realize we're we're creating windows we're creating trainability windows temporary neurophysiological windows in order to then do put a stimulus in there and actually create more permanent change i.e well now that we can go ass to grass in a squat we can access this new range and this new um position great yeah and then you load it and learn it well said yeah, I know. I'm impressed with that one. That's a new one today. That's you write that like, one down. Load yeah, it and learn that. But yeah, it's the exact same thing. I used to do the same thing. We used to have all our clients, um, when they got into the gym, like they'd foam roll for five minutes. Every single time. We'd have 16 clients foam rolling at once. Every hour on the hour. It, um, and you know, getting rid of it, we didn't really see any increase in niggles, aches and pains. We didn't see any decrease in range of motion, but foam rolling, like, yeah, it does create some kind of change. It is some kind of transient change. So it's not bad or good. If someone enjoys it, like, awesome. Like, yeah. cool, keep doing it. They'll keep them training. If, I think the, um, the biopsychosocial world, the BPS people have really, they've done two really, they've done one really bad and one really good thing. The good thing is they've made people, us realize that we're a little bit more resilient than what we thought. Our body is a lot more adaptable to change and what we believed negative positions aren't necessarily such a bad thing. You mean, like okay, round, let's give an example. What do you mean by negative? Like, like, like slight round back deadlift, for example. Yes. Like it's not going to kill you. Yes. Okay. Um, it's not, knees cave, cave in a squat once. Oh my God, your MCL is not going to tear off. Exactly. That's all fine. But that, that all those ideas are really, really good and that people should do stuff that they can do. Some of the stuff they've done that's not so great is they've made they then basically discount everything like foam rolling, static stretching, all these tools, which have been used in coaching for a long, long time. A lot of people are like, Oh, well, the evidence isn't hundred percent conclusive in that. The evidence on anything is never hundred percent conclusive. Well, we can't wait. We can't wait. Well, I'm sorry. We can't, I don't, we can't wait for all the randomized controlled trials to tell me, especially with nutrition. This is where people get really emotional. Like I can't wait 50 years um, to explain gluten and dairy and um, gut health, right? There's so much still we, we don't know about gut health and neurotransmitters and the, the enteric nervous system. I just can't wait. Like, I have to base some knowledge off some experience and some anecdotal evidence and just intrinsically how I feel. And that's cool. And that that's that's the, the art part of coaching. There's the art and the science. The, the science of co coaching isn't clear yet. Like, in nutrition, just to use that as an example, is a very young discipline. Like in terms of how long we've actually been studying nutrition properly, it's very young. Yeah. Uh, so there's things that we're going to get wrong. There's probably things that we've gotten right, but we don't we don't know everything yet. With the um the other part of the BPS guys, they've let form go. So it's now like, oh cool, just let people lift how they want. Like don't worry about that as long as they're exercising. Like, right. like that's just ridiculous. Like biomechanics is been going for a fair while now like there's a lot of coaches that got a lot of people really strong and help people a lot and using biomechanical principles like physics hasn't changed man mm -hmm. like <laughs> tissues get loaded in crappy positions repeatedly they do have uh, a tolerant tolerable limit until they break so i've seen videos of bps practitioners basically mocking people for training properly and doing round back deadlifts repeatedly for reps and not like a powerlifting round back deadlift where like a decent lifter will do it because that's their technique it's global flexion but, yeah yeah they're just like oh yeah just jerking herking and putting up videos of people lifting with terrible techniques saying isn't it great that they're taking control it's not it's not great <laughs> it's it's cool that they're doing something yes absolutely but the fact that you're just standing there and being a glorified cheerleader because you want to support them psychologically versus 
telling someone that, hey, you need to fix this up because A, there is probably an increased likelihood you're going to get injured, but B, there's a very strong probability that you're not going to progress as far as you could. In fact, it's nearly a guaranteed likelihood. We need to do things right. We need to do things better. Because otherwise, why the hell are the coaches anyway? People can just do it however they want. Right. I mean, do you think that's the problem with being a check practitioner only or a, or a BPS guy only or this guy only, a polyquin practitioner only? It's like you are yes. you have a team and a dogma and you just whoever disagrees yes. is like they challenge my identity and that means, oh, I can't see commonality and we can't find common ground. Exactly. I've, I've, I've got a book coming out in two weeks and it's like a real print book. Oh, like, really? And oh, yeah, it. it's taken a long damn time to get out. But anyway, um, COVID, right? Yeah. Uh, the first nutritional principle, like it's basically nine principles that relate to training, nutrition, and to mindset that I base my career on as a coach and as a trainer. And nutrition principle number one, although it kind of applies to, and it's reflected in all the other uh, principles, is no dogma. Mm. Because as soon as you have a dogma, you limit yourself in terms of the information that you're willing to take on board. You, like um, a dogmatic vegan will not listen to yeah. other people's opinions in their carnivores, for example. Yeah, uh, That's a strong example, but common. a no, dogmatic polycom, polycom practitioner, for example. Oh, yeah. Like they're like Swiss balls are stupid. Yeah. Um, or someone who's like a dogmatic Olympic weightlifter. They're like... When they look at sporting performance facilities and they see like smaller squats done to down to a box for an athlete who's in season, where you're trying to reduce their range of motion and just maintain force output, they're going to go, "You're an idiot." That's I've seen that a hundred times over. Uh, so as soon as you've got dogma, you limit the amount of information you'll take in, and then you limit the ability to critically analyze and break down the information that you've got. So you can't. You, basically, as soon as you become dogmatic, you lose the ability to self-reflect. Well said. It's like everything gets a bit foggy, right? You yep. can't make as clear decisions. And that's never been more present now. It's like, how do you... But how do you get through that? Like, how, how do you... Because we've all experienced it. We can all get caught up in dogma, right? How do you recognize it? How can we help each other recognize it, right? No. Oh, Paul, Paul Meldrum's uh, mindset principle number two, self-compassion. No. <laughs> Little plug there. So, first thing is, a lot of people just aren't aware about the fact that these cognitive biases exist, right? Yeah. Which is, I find it that's been hard to, to I understand. Like when you talk to people and you just like, why the hell do they don't realize that they're just banging their head into a wall? Why are they thinking this? It's cognitive biases. Like despite being so well researched, it's still not very evident to people, and a lot of people don't aren't interested in exploring past their dogma. Um, in getting past their bias. So for me, it was the first, the first fact of it was learning that there are cognitive biases because I used to think I was right at all cost mm. until I got older and realized I was stupid and I get most things wrong most of the time. And that's the Dunning-Kruger effect, I think, a little bit there. Exactly. Um, learning, oh, cool, these cognitive biases exist. Oh, these are different things. These are why people are thinking this way. But then once you get that, there's always that little bit of smug sense of superiority that you know something that other people don't know. Mm. Ego. Uh, ego, yeah, ego decides to go, yeah, cool. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I know about that. I know about the sunk cost fallacy. You don't. Um, <laughs> sucked in, loser. <laughs> Why are you still doing your squats on a Swiss ball, man? <laughs> so once you, you realize that, then it's kind of like, all right, cool. Well, what do I do with this information? And like a lot of time when you've got that, it's kind of like when I started re realizing the art and the science of self-compassion that, you know, we're a common humanity, so we've all made the same damn mistakes. Mm. Um, we're going to, we're not, none of us are really that unique in terms of our experiences, like what we experience other people have probably had to some extent. Maybe not exactly the same, but like, you know, losing a family member. Everyone's had that at one point. Um, everyone's probably thought that they were right at some point when they were totally wrong. Um, so realizing that being able to first forgive yourself for then having that experience because there's that tendency to beat yourself up when you realize you've been yeah. following a dogma, but then being able to apply it to other people and listen in a bit more of a non-judgmental framework and then just to be able to ask them more questions to hopefully break their dogma, not break their, dog not break their dogma with the point of actually talking to someone and going, you know what, 
this person believes this shit. I'm going to mess their world up. Yeah. That's very rarely a productive way to... You, do, you don't want to try and change the other person, right? No, you want them... If they're doing something that's... Uh, as a coach, for example, we'll go into that framework. If, they're doing, if they believe something that's inherently harmful to them, but is damaging them, there is a like duty of care to make them realize that that's not a great idea. But I think having conversations with people in a way that is more geared towards them having realizations rather than you giving them information is much more powerful. It's to give people their own personal aha moment yeah. for, oh shit, that's right. That's not, that isn't working for me. And if they do realize it, that's fantastic. More power to them. If they don't realize it at that point, that's okay. It's not that time yet for them because we're all on a different speed of our journey and we're all dealing with stuff that, you know, you don't ever know what someone's dealing with. Like yeah. it's the biggest quote in social media at the moment because Chadwick Boseman just passed away yeah. and no one knew that he was dealing with... Um, Is that holding. true? Did, did the people who he worked with didn't know? Like the... I don't know how many people that like he's... Like I'm, I'm sure the directors and producers would have known because he would have had to go off for treatment and stuff. But a lot of people had no idea like the battle that he was fighting. And certainly not the public. And like people were bagging him out Black like, Panther for being too skinny. Like now when you look at it, you're like, yeah. mm, damn, shit. I feel like a bit of a knob. Like, um, he had his own personal battle, so like he wouldn't, he couldn't put a muscle right um, as easily. We got people who are going through their own personal battles, their own personal stresses. So if they don't realize that their dogma is harming them at that particular time, it's not doesn't have to be our place to force that for them to change. Mm -hmm. It's just being accepting of like, all right, cool, they did, or they didn't. It's it's still all good. They're still on their own personal journey. We don't need to. We love them. It's hard, but it's that it's a very it's a nuanced area. Yeah, I think well, it reminds me of I don't know if you kind of got that idea from Jordan Peterson, but especially the aha movement. You don't want to take it from somebody because that's a gift. Right. Like that's um, I think the the change is a lot more permanent, like concrete setting. If they if I can come up with my solution, but maybe you can stimulate some leading questions, right? I think that's one way to get to it. That's how I found. Well. Maybe don't, instead of offering information, just leading questions. How else would you suggest that people can communicate more effectively so people can get to those aha movements? Cool. Um, the first one is shutting up. Listen. <laughs> and listening. Um, John Barati had a qu uh, quote. I, saw, I was looking at it for a seminar. He didn't use two ears and uh, one mouth. He used two ears, two eyes, and one, one, one mouth. Because so much of... Uh, Communication is nonverbal. Yeah. Just watching people and seeing how they respond to different things. But in terms of other way of getting there is if I'm going to bring it back to a coaching context, because that's where my skill lies, it's always letting the client drive it. So I'm very client centered in my communication methods. So if someone's looking to do that, I'm always asking, how's that working for you? And trying to understand where the positives are in that as well versus then asking questions to help them decide where the negatives are. Yeah. So I'm not uh, very rarely in my, back in my day, back in the day, I used to love delivering information Yeah, as much as possible to clients. It's, it's very ego gratifying. Yes. It really is. Like there's not my, it's really cool feelings getting in front of like a group of people and giving a seminar or a lecture where you're talking about pretty much all the stuff that you know and you come across as really, really smart and it all makes sense. And people are like, wow, that was great. Well, what'd you change from that? Oh, nothing. Then I kind of failed you. I remember doing, well, you remember Sports Kin, right? Sports. Oh, sports uh, Kinesiology? Yeah. Yeah, SK. I did, a, um, I did a five day nutrition workshop for Sports Kinesiology and their advanced diploma stuff years ago. And like it was stuff like neural regulation of appetite, uh, endocrine regulators of this. It was like look at the lateral accurate nucleus, the hypothalamus, how that affects um, how that senses ghrelin levels, for example. <laughs> You're in the weeds. Where, where, where are we going with this? Deep and people deep. were like, I was like looking at the course reviews uh, after the course, and they're like, oh, it was amazing information. So much knowledge presented. So much passion and blah, 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 right? I was like, oh, cool, this feels really good. I feel like I've achieved something. And then I look at these people six months later after like, at the catch up and I'm like, they're all the same. 
Mm. They're all exactly the same. There's been no, what you've been doing different since then. Oh, nothing. How's your nutrition coaching changed? Hasn't. It was like, well, I, I, it took me a while to realize that I stuffed it up. I made a huge mistake. I taught that was, the way I was teaching was absolutely terrible. So after a while, it took a longer to realize the way I was communi- communicating to clients was exactly the same. So a lot of time I had these people who were getting what I would consider to be the highest level of information with the lowest level of change. So what's the point? Um, where, and then I basically went my communication, like, how's that working for you? That's the, that's a good question. I need, I need how's a, that working for you? Yeah. What are the positives of that? And then people would say to me, oh, I'm going to change something. Like, oh, I'm going to quit alcohol, for example. Yeah. But well, what are the negatives in that? And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, there's negatives to it. And they're like, oh, I don't, oh, well, I guess I wouldn't be socializing as much. So it became a process of me from learning that and asking these questions to become way less judgmental for whatever someone wanted to do with their nutrition, their training or their lifestyle, uh, way less judgmental and realize, hey, cool, let's just find, if people find their own middle ground, that's where they're gonna find their aha moment. Mm-hmm. Because then they get, and that led to a deeper understanding of human psychology. Like when people start to make their own decisions and they start to build autonomy, they start and they see success, they develop intrinsic motivation. They then uh, autonomy, intrinsic motivation, and then they get that kind of like rolling success pattern. Mm. So that was that's how I go about dealing with that, helping people with their dogmas. It's to let them explain the dogma, do most of the talking for me, get them to see that there's a positive and negative to both sides of it and let them create their own their own solution and their own aha. Uh, just watch. And then you kind of get out the way, right? Like, yeah. you let them, it's like, I think that's such a great point because as any person who has any expertise in a field, you want to be the knower, right? You are the knower. And so if you, you explained it very honestly and I really appreciate that because... Um, I think a, a lot of people don't uh, aren't able to honestly deploy how much of a gratifying, satisfying, egotistical feeling it can be to step in front. It. Yeah, yeah, right. It feels great, right. but it's also a trap. Yes, because it traps you into like mistaking. No, no, that's not the word. It's like you're mistaking. Hmm, I'm just. You're very caught up in the weeds of delivering information without maybe creating actual change, which is what I heard from you. Yes, that's correct. You become so wrapped up in the idea of this is me, this is who I am, this is what I'm here for. I'm here as I'm here on my mountain holding my two tablets, <laughs> telling people, telling the folks information that they need to know. The stuff that's coming out my my brain and my mouth is so powerful that it's automatically going to change people just by the sheer virtue of knowing it. Yeah. And it's such that's when you see like educators in well any sphere they they get their heads really far stuck up their colons like they they become so into themselves and it's like this smug sense of superiority that we know more and man the people paying our wages the people who pay us to see us they earn more money than us and they don't even understand the difference between a monounsaturated fat and a polyunsaturated fat what they, yeah they also don't really need to right we think they do we think we need to tell them about all the things they don't need to know about the things. They need to make their own decisions for things that are better for them. They're, and we just, uh, it, not that we never give information, we occasionally do. If someone's in like, I guess, the contemplation state of change, if someone's in that, that state where they're like contemplating, sometimes a bit of information delivered at the right time to the right level of their nutritional, not all psychological or training knowledge is ideal. Um, because to help push them in that direction and create that impetus for change, but it's a very small component. Mm-hmm. And like it used to be the total opposite for me. It's like, I wouldn't listen, someone would come for a nutrition seminar or a consult, pardon me, and it would just be me talking at them for an hour, telling them all I knew, all the things I didn't know and all the shit they were doing wrong. And man, as an adult, like we don't need to be told we're doing stuff wrong. We already we feel bad enough anyway. Yeah. Like we're struggling, like people struggling. So change that change that mindset around it help people out the results are so much better and coaching becomes so much easier i I, yeah it's such an important um point in conversation i know i've made that mistake like with with some people in the past with some clients more than others maybe clients who you you feel like and people you feel like you want not even just clients let's talk about like average person people you feel like they might be 
living a suboptimal life. They are suffering um, voluntarily and unnecessarily. And you think you have the solution or you have part of the solution. And so only if they knew that information, if only you knew this nutrition, uh, this habit, and this thing, you wouldn't be unnecessarily suffering anymore. But if, like... There's so many layers to why that doesn't work. Like one, they're not re- like receptive. They already know the information. They or, or they can find it themselves. You take it away from them, and the, you, you, they can't solve the problem themselves. I think it's like information. It's. I don't think we need more of it a lot of the times, right? No, we need more implementation. Yeah, there you go. And we need um, to stagger that implementation into achievable chunks. Yeah. So like, we know. Uh, Really, there's only a few scenarios. So I'll just go into the scenarios where that doesn't matter, yeah. that context, because nothing is universal. Yeah. Well, there's a few universal things, but most things always have that. But, yeah, it's yeah. funny you say nothing's universal, but it's like then go back on yeah. that. Like even that yeah. statement itself. Yeah, I know, right? But um, say someone comes to me for a body composition goal and they want to get on the bodybuilding stage, right? Yeah. They want to win. Um, it's kind of like if someone go see a uh, Christian, for example, and they want to re- rehab from their ACL tear and a hamstring tear and they want to get back in the AFL field. Sure. They've got to do exactly what he says, right? Yeah. Because he's got his expertise and that's a higher level goal. Yeah. Like that's a goal where they're not, like man, if someone's got, career is ending in professional football, yeah. for example. They'll do whatever you, you say. You do, yeah, you do what I say or go home, go yeah. see another client, go see another coach who'll um, humor you. If someone comes to me and they want to get, say, on the bodybuilding stage, for example, I'm like, cool, these are your macros and you don't go over it or I'll kill you. Um, like it's, this is a training you have to do. Suck it up. You're doing 12,000 steps today. No, you're doing it. Why haven't you done it? Do 14,000 tomorrow. Fix it. Yeah. Uh, that's the higher level goals that people come to us, which are admittedly few and far between. That's when we get to put on that coach's hat and go, this is what we're going to do, which having those skills and the knowledge that we've spent a lot of time, money and effort to accumulate becomes really, really important. Most of the time when we've got all that knowledge that we've spent that time, money and accumulate to important, we need to then distill that down to the smallest possible fragment that that particular individual who's coming to us can then implement in a staggered way. Yeah. So someone, and as a coach, sometimes what we've got to do is then even stop people from implementing it in a way that they've even suggested to us because they're trying to impress us because their ego gets in the way and goes, I'm like, here's an example. Someone comes to me and it's like, they bring their food journal. That's my main nutrition coaching tool. I'll look at it and go, oh, cool. I've noticed, I've noticed you're drinking 12 beers a night. Example, that's the example, that's the behavior. Hmm. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, how's that working for you? Tell- is that the time? Yeah, is that, is that, how's that working for you? And then I go into a process where I basically question them on the impact of that. That's affecting your sleep, man. Oh, pretty bad, hey. <laughs> how's your training? If how's your training going? Oh, I got a headache every morning. I barely get to the gym. How's your relationship going? Well, I'm always pissed. So I never have sex. Like it builds on and on. Right, what do you want to change from that? Because once that person's clarified to me all the impacts it had in their life, yeah, they're generally at that point where they're ready to change. Our, my job as a coach, man, is to they're gonna probably gonna say because they feel like they've had this moment with me. They've realized something that's all profound for them at that time. I'm going to cut alcohol out totally. Now that comes from uh, them from that conversation, right? Yeah, from them is their idea. My job as a coach is to go, well, hold up a minute, hold up a minute, hold up. You've been drinking this much alcohol for this long. This is a habit that you've got pretty well ingrained into your body. You know that you're ready to change and that's fantastic. I'm super I'm happy, I'm proud of you, etc. Yeah. Do you think it's realistic that you're going to go from you know hero of drinking to zero you think you're really going to do that or yeah all right let's break that down a notch because people will always what's it think you overestimate what you can do in a year and underestimate what you can do in 10 people will be like i want to change it all now and fix it today Mm. and unfortunately from experience and how humans work it's very hard for us to change it a very strongly ingrained habit like that, particularly one with psychopharmological properties like alcohol overnight. My job as a coach is go, are you ready? Drop down to nothing. Oh yeah, 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 I'm ready. Are you willing? Oh, not really. Are you able to? Not really. So, and then we can bring it down to a level where I feel com- 
I feel confident they can do it. They feel confident they can do it. And then every single time they, well, not every single time, but let's say nine times out of 10, they will exceed the expectation they've set for themselves, which then builds that autonomy, intrinsic motivation and the ability to perform. And self-efficacy. But it's built yeah. upon the fact that you didn't set the bar so high that they can have these little wins. In fact, you might set it a little bit lower. You know, Peterson talks yeah. about this where it's like, well, you know, you might be depressed and anxious and your life might be miserable. Well, okay. Um, whatever the thing you uh, plan to do and want to improve, he gets almost comedically um, small of a habit. Like he's talking like, all right, go outside and walk up and down your street. Just a minute. Yeah. Simple as that. Can you do that? Yes. Oh, you can't do that? that? Oh, okay. How about you just walk to your door and back? It might sound like ridiculous, right? Like what? But it's that's where it's built upon for even the people at the bottom of the pit. Yeah, and he he's the make he's one of the people who's talking about making the bed, right? Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Even that there, that's such a that's such a great example. Clean your room, particularly. Clean your room. Yeah. yeah, that's the one. Uh, clean your room, like you, you you can do that. Cool. Uh, it's building that foundation of self efficacy. If that's what we should be trying, we're looking people to go all the way back to getting out their dogma. Uh, their dogma is a part of their identity. Building their self efficacy in things that challenge that will help eventually dissolve that dogma anyway. Yeah. Without us having to go, you're already kid. You, I can't believe you're a vegan or whatever it is. Yeah. Whatever their dogma is. That, I hope that that message, thing, I wish that's something that could be taught. Like this type of communication style, like understanding cognitive biases, understanding um, how to how to win friends and influence people, how to create change, essentially. But the education system that modern society is built on seems to be quite, um, how do I say, broken in, in yeah, some ways. Fine to say that. Yeah, it is, it is broken. It's based on um, learning information in a rote format without problem-solving skills. Mm. without financial management skills, without even more importantly than that, self-management skills. I can't remember a single time in school where I was taught to manage my emotions. Now that's bonkers. Yeah, like if you think about what you have to deal with every single day, it's life is an emotional battle. Like stuff happens, stuff gets hard. You don't get taught that. You learn, you read 1984 for example, by George Orwell, yet you never, and you write an essay about it and you try and put the word juxtaposition in it so that you get rid of the mark <laughs> and, <laughs> and dystopian uh, right. reality. Yet you never learn, all right, cool, how would that make you feel? You never discuss any of the feelings behind it. You do business studies and you never look at, all right, cool, this is a SWOT analysis. Yeah, but what's the entrepreneurial journey? What What's the mindset of an entrepreneur? You don't actually Every subject you break down at school, you don't actually look at how, in our education system, how you should think about it or how you could think about it and then how that makes you feel and then reflecting on whether that's right or wrong. Right. And then being able to argue both sides as equally as you can argue your own. This is something recently in the last couple of years that I've come to fruition. Like, I have this document. I take a lot of notes and I have um, this Evernote document called Arguments For and Against. And I have one on meat, um, plant-based eating versus meat-based eating. And... Mm. Like, I'm not always good at it because I'm omnivore. I eat, I eat both. I love both. And so, but I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to say, okay, what about, uh, you know, uh, pro-life, like abortion to not abort, right? That conversation. What about religion, right? And I think, what if we all did that? What if we all had a maybe some type of app or vehicle or opportunity where we could have a... Dialogue to argue both sides for and against. Yeah, that would be ideal. Like, um, because <laughs> most people don't ever, like, <laughs> most people never go for and against. Their for is their for. Yeah. It's their dogma and they're married to it. The longest relationship they have in their life is with their dogmas. Like, yeah. it's <laughs> funny it's, that. It's not, <laughs> no, people in general, because we're not taught at a young age to challenge our dogmas and what we're taught in education system is essentially a series of dogmas. Like it's like, if we just use religion as an example in schools, like what, what's the religion that most Australian based schools teach? Christ, uh, Christianity. Yeah. Christianity, Catholicism based things. Yeah. Um, we're not really 
exposed to Islam belief systems. We're not exposed to Buddhist teachings. We're not exposed to uh, Tao Te Ching, like all these different concepts which have inherent value and yeah. then also have inherent contradictions with some of the beliefs of Christianity. So we're not, we don't challenge those dogmas. Um, it's very much like the idea of a set curriculum which has, there's some things that we need to learn. Yes, that's cool. But the idea of a set curriculum where we never actually go outside of that and never look at things in another perspective, it kind of reinforces a way of looking at the world, which then, because most people then go into the workforce and they work for a company that sees the world a particular way, it doesn't get challenged. Well, that's the thing. Um, I'm going to pull it up now because I want to remember accurately. Do you actually remember or know why schools, traditional school system was built? I have no idea. I've never actually looked at it, so I have no idea. So, let me say, I got. Are you, I don't know if you're familiar with Seth Godin. Um, yeah. Who, this is Marketing Purple Cow. Yes, who's an incredible uh, marketer and author and writer. He writes, he's unbelievable. He's written a, an article every single day for like the last decade plus. It never stops. It's yeah. Good. Unbelievably consistent. So, we, we, he said, we failed to ask the key question what is school for? We know what it is used for. That was to train obedient factory workers. We didn't have enough, so we built this system on uh, the purpose to train kids to sit for six to nine hours a day, follow instructions, and conform to a set strict guidelines. And it worked. We got plenty of factory workers, and we were compliant. Who would put up with all, all that sorts of nonsense for... for who, who would put up all, uh, all sorts of nonsense for a paycheck? So what is school for now? Teach people to lead and teach them to solve interesting problems. That's what it should be for. The way you do that is by teaching kids to fail at solving interesting problems, because that's the uh, only way you ever get good at solving interesting problems and so that's what I won't keep reading because it goes on but basically a little window into well after the war I believe it was after the uh, World War II sometime like fact and uh, even during it I believe like the industrial early industrial revolution like we needed factory workers we needed uh, these commodities and resources and the school system is set up in a very convenient way to prepare people for that type of behavior. Now, I'm willing to concede that this might be a bit off, but this is from my understanding so far what it seems to be. Yeah, well, that seems um, like a fairly accurate representation of it because you look at some of the stuff that's happening in the school system now, it's quite archaic. Like, why are kids having to wear ties? Like just even from the uniforms and the guidelines that they have around that, like that's not how real world works. Like who, we don't really, the only place you wear uniforms now is like retail, like fast food, et cetera. It's, that, it's a very archaic way. It's like literally setting people up the idea that they get dressed and put a tie on every day. Well, it actually, if you think about it, I'm gonna use the example of uh, Nazi Germany. What they would do with prisoners is they would shave them all down. They would make them all skinless, uh, hairless, right? So that they would get rid of all the hair on them, right? And they would all have the same rags and like there would be no uniqueness, right? Yeah. And listening and reading and understanding this, it was for conformity, right? They wanted everybody to conform maximally and not have any individual indiv individualization that may give them potentially hope or other emotions, positive emotions. Now, and discipline as well. Now, on the other side of the school system, Right, ties, uniform, or well, what's this good for? We're all on the same team. We're gonna conform. You will listen and behave. And if you, you drop your tie too low, we're gonna tell you to raise it up because that's not the way we like it. Because that's not being disciplined. And so, it's a strange, but it makes sense. Rule. Yeah, it makes sense. Rule, but I don't. I'm sure you're in the same agreement here that for the modern world, which is basically an information-based world now. Yeah. We're brokers of information and implementation. We're not going to be going into a factory because that's been automated. We've gone past that. Exactly. Uh, that's the point. Humans, the biggest issues back then were things like, can we get enough food? Can we get enough resources? Uh, particularly with World War, you need to build resources. Now it's like, can we sustain our environment? Can we create a better solution? So our environment's yeah. here in 10, 15, 20, 30 years. Um, there's problems that we are dealing with now COVID, for example, a pandemic, what's a way that we can deal with a pandemic without uh, sacrificing all our personal freedoms? Well, some places you can't <laughs> mm. because of the government, whatever. Mm. Um, 
it's these are problems that require thinking lots of intel like thinking but also the ability to look at both sides of an argument and they be able to draw up a solution that works out, which is a very complex task that a lot of people who are in these positions haven't really had training to do yet and our like we see it like with the uh all the protests and stuff like that people are looking at things in a different way now and people it's kind of like another time of revolution similar to this uh america with the vietnam war in the 70s people are speaking up about these injustices again it seems to go happen in waves like historically in waves there's protests things get changed a little bit go back to normal we're going through that wave again now where we've got so many problems in the world that don't we can't use the solutions that we used to they don't work anymore mm. we need new solutions for that by new people with different skill sets what do you think some of those solutions could be if you I'm not would probably smart enough to do that um the, uh, for the problem like um and i don't i wouldn't uh say i would have the knowledge to solve. You see this is what from the smartest people i consistently hear like they feign uh also not faint they um they admit humility and they admit their ignorance i'm not smart enough for it yet we always seem to have one individual to represent uh, or to make these decisions. Now, I know there's a team usually behind them, but it seems strange that there's always usually just one person who's making these decisions when everybody who I know who's really smart, who, I, who we see commonly who are really intelligent, say, oh, I'm not smart enough to solve that problem, but they're just one person. Yeah, it needs to be a more collaborative type effort. Um, yeah. Like, it's... I, I, I spend a fair bit of time looking at America Same. at the moment because it's fascinating. Yeah. You're seeing what's going on in that country and what their leader, the decisions that he's making on a day to day basis. What are you seeing? What am I seeing? I'm seeing a man with a great haircut uh, focusing on, like a couple of weeks ago, he was, he changed a rule to get rid of, make it compulsory for shower heads to minimize water flow so he could get better shampoo. Yeah. But better flow, yeah. Better flow work because he needs his hair to be perfect, right? Yeah. He um, actually passed that legislation? Yes. All right, cool. Um, I was like, that seems to me like an odd use of time, presidential resources, and it, even to speak about Yeah. at that time. For a country that's got over, that's burning, it's got police shootings, riots, all this kind of stuff, um, his decision to bring the National Guard in for a, which is a military thing which he doesn't have the authority to do which he still seems to manage to pull off somehow it fascinates me how a country like that which has been a world power for so long has lost is losing its status mm -hmm. in terms of like the new world powers are going to be in uh, probably Asian based China China sure. Japan yeah um, America's losing that kind of luster and like it's I don't know how they can solve all their problems in the USA. There's a lot of them. Um, assuming equality to most people would be a good starting point. And p having better training in particularly their police system. Like I looked at the length of time it takes to become a police officer. In there, it's very short compared to most other careers. Mm. And it seems like the standards are fairly low. But it's interesting seeing how one person with... Uh, extraordinary amount of power and authority who doesn't seem to have the critical thinking skills which that interview with the Australian person really kind of made apparent You've, I'm sure you saw it wait say that again the, the Australian the newspaper yeah, and he's looking at it and he's shuffling the papers and it's made all those really funny memes now I don't think I've seen it he was talking about death rates and like Trump was shuffling papers and trying to show him evidence of a certain way in the Australian it's an Australian guy. And he's like, well, you can also look at it like this. Right. And Trump's immediate response is, no, you can't. Right. You can't look at the data like that. You can't do that. That was his response. And that was kind of like, for me, looking at him say, you can't do it like that. That was quite reflective of the whole thought process that so many of us have that you can't look at it another way. And if we can't look at things another way, uh, the problems that we're faced with, which are very complex problems, multiple dimensions, can we ever solve them? Mm. We need to be able to look at it the other way. And that's where I can see the argument for so many people, which they have, we need to bring in people, have more diverse groups of decision makers. And it's not for the sake of having 
just diversity for the sake of diversity. It's right. diversity for the sake of having different opinions and different viewpoints and different perspectives on the world. And then how can we marry that together into a solution that's going to be win-win for all of us? Exactly. That seems like a big step forward into solving problems is what we talked about earlier and what you're saying now is bringing people together to have an open, honest dialogue trying to remove dogma best we can. Now, how practical that is from like a government uh, position is, is, is questionable. But yes. individually, we all have the autonomy to do that. And individual, I think we get caught up like thinking we're only one person. What, what can't, you know, you know, what can I do? It's like, you're only one person. What can't you do? Like you can do so much. And so I think we can influence each other by being the change we want to see. I say that time and time again. Yeah, it's a, it's a, we can be the change you want to see in the world, Mahatma Gandhi. It's a very, he was one dude and he, he did a lot. Martin Luther King, he was one person. He did a lot. He had a whole bunch of Mandela. They all had screw ups as well. And I think that's um, one thing when we do get into thinking about can one person change the world? Oh, they did it. I can't. It's because we look at them and we go, oh, they're perfect. Or well, they had something that we don't have. They all screwed up horrendously. They made tons of mistakes, but they had the, uh, I guess, go back to one of my mindset concepts, like self-compassion, do you go, oh, okay, cool. I stuffed up. How am I going to react to this? Am I just going to give up or am I going to learn? Absolutely. That growth mindset. So if you, one person can make a ton of, and it's a ton of changes, which and we do do that. Like even we only influence our own circle. Yeah, that's huge. Do that. Yeah, that's huge because that our circle has its own circle, which exactly. has its own circle, which has its own circle. It's a series of concentric ripples that go out, and um, if we do that, like it's change, then happens very quickly. But, and it's that idea, right? If that idea permeates throughout a population, the sky's the limit because those ripples are now everywhere. Yeah, well, it's Black Lives Matter. Uh, that movement started with, with "I can't breathe." Mm -hmm. right. and then that rippled all throughout the world and you had something we'd never seen in history and that's uh, every major city in every major country having a protest in solidarity for a idea yeah it's an, it's an idea like it all came from one like it happened to one person and that created a ripple in that circle which created a ripple out and out and out and, it, and of course it's very unfortunate for that one person but the person who then the next person who was affected by that and then just protested that for lack of a better word because it's one person that's what created that upward ripple absolutely and we see like um if we have people in prominence who say stuff about like um basketball at the moment yeah like activism is in the nba like they shut down the league the other day that was like from what i've read that was driven by one person spoke out about that george hill from the milwaukee bucks yeah he's a role player he's a bench player Six he was trading for yeah. Kawhi Leonard. What a what a terrible trade that was. But anyway, let's um, he he was like, you know, we should pro we should forfeit the game. But that's what he said. He said when they were going at halftime, we should forfeit. We should just give up or whatever. Just get away from it. His individual statement had a ripple through the team, which had a ripple through the NBA bubble, which led to four major US sports not playing. Oh, is that what actually happened? Like, can you? Can you yeah, it was George Hill. He he literally said we should um boycott this so the other major sports what was it it was um baseball uh, WNBA as well yep. uh soccer baseball there was uh tennis players as well who who weren't going to play those couple of days because it was like literally not, thousands of athletes have just gone up we're not doing this shit this is there's yeah, more I know lebron things. is very strong-minded on this and uh, he's saying like no we're not playing we're pulling out entirely yeah. is that tr still true they if what happened from my understanding is that Michael Jordan got involved and they he organized something with the owners association and pledged three hundred million dollars to Black Lives Matter as a political statement and then they so again like from one person that George Hill's making an off the cuff comment because he was he had the shits in the whole situation. They've got the NBA owners pledging three hundred million dollars. All the players today were going on about how we're saying that they're registering to vote today everyone in the bubble which for like america registering the vote that's a bit strange that they didn't even have already done that but it's great that they're doing it but yeah, yeah. and JR, yeah you know jr smith yeah 
crazy dude who takes his shirt off and parades. He's great. Um, the one who screwed up game one against the Warriors, uh, Cleveland. Right. The crappy, his terrible decision. I remember him from the Knicks. That's that's yeah. Yeah. He was amazing in the Knicks. He, yeah. He was good. Um, he's he's like on Twitter, like he's the total goofball, and just like saying to all the players that they're registering all today. Um, but then that social change in that, you look at that. America, like, Australia's compulsory voting. Yeah, I don't understand um, why that just doesn't exist in a country like America. My, my, I, I have no idea. But from here, like, if all these NBA players and athletes are registering to vote and they're sharing that with their respective fan bases who may or may not have voted before, let's just say they may not have voted, it changes the numbers of people who vote for change to drastically. So this is all like that, an example of that like ripple effect. One player, like a, a bench role player said, man, let's boycott. Absolutely. It's like the $300 million so far and pledged money, a ton of awareness, yeah. um, a more awareness, which it still needs. And then now hopefully hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of people who wouldn't have voted will now vote. Exactly. And I think that these types of ripples we see throughout history, throughout our times, I think you see it in the stock market when people, like when Elon Musk uh, smoked weed on Joe Rogan's podcast, you see <laughs> the stocks dip and they spiked up. When Joe yep. Rogan announced, I don't think people are really feeling the effects of what's going to happen here, but when Joe Rogan announced the Spotify deal, right? Yeah. Spotify stock shot up. Okay, that's expected. And I think it's just the beginning of what's going to happen there. But I think what we're seeing is by one individual pledging uh, alliance and, and, and allegiance with another platform, right? That can significantly change the landscape of media and Spotify being what will soon become a video platform to rival what people don't realize is the second biggest search engine in the world, YouTube, mm -hmm which has been notoriously, you know, uh, criticized for its censorship and its monetization issues. I'm very familiar with it because I've been on here for years and years. And people think, oh, who cares? YouTube, Google, um, Spotify, what does it matter? It's like these companies, these huge, huge companies by a decision from one or two people can change the landscape of how we absorb and interact with media like TikTok with Trump, you know, things like this. Yeah, and... The flip side of that as well, like with the ripple effect, is now because of these media things and the reach now that every individual has because of the World Wide Web, the ripples can be a lot quicker. Yes. Change doesn't have to spread at a grassroots level anymore. It doesn't have to go from people actually speaking to people to then reading about it in the newspaper the next day. Like you get, we have it all here on our phones telling us every minute of the day what's going on. And that, that those changes now, like people with their own personal platforms, like um, if they are famous, like Insta like people with Instagram followers, they can make huge changes worldwide very, very quickly. Not influence, not 10,000 in the blue dot, like I'm talking about the millions of followers. People can get anywhere very quickly now, and that's which I think we estimate a lot because there's so much noise out there. But if there's good messages, like if you good message, if a message changes one person, one person sees it, um, that can then lead to them influencing another one person, which can lead, it just kind of goes on and on. And like, that's something I have to argue all the time with like my mentoring students. I'm like, put some stuff up that's actually decent that you care about. And that why no one, I only get two likes. I'm like, who cares if you get two likes? You've made something just that's keep going. real and changes someone. Like those two likes, you, like one person might be your mom just supporting whatever you do, who cares? Um, one might be, hey, you've done something and you've actually got, you've changed someone's life, man. Like that, that stuff is immeasurable. We really underestimate the power and significance of one person. And especially in that sense, like you get demotivated and, and down. And I, I've been there before. I think we most people have where... You know, you might not be as superficially successful as you think you deserve or, or right now crave and need and want egotistically as well. But it just, it's a domino, right? It's like if one person with enough influence finds and shares your piece of content, 
that can be like a spark of fire that can change your life. Yeah, absolutely. Like I've seen it myself. Like I don't, I haven't got the hugest social media presence and never have I've been kind of a long time. It's kind of like a thing you must do, right? I think I want to do. Like at DC, running a gym, I hated doing it. Yeah. Hated it. Um, and like we had one experience where like former business partner asked me what keto was. And I was like, how do you not, like, how do you not know? And I was drinking a coffee and he's like, I'll just film you and we'll put it up. It turned into me, have, he filmed a one minute video and it turned into me talking to people like Alan Aragon, uh, like one of the world's foremost sports nutrition researchers about stuff. Uh, Dr. Mike Israchel arguing with other people who are pro keto. Uh, my viewpoint was I wasn't even against it, which is hilarious, but like one, one post, one, one and a half minute video, I'm talking with world respected, uh, world leading researchers and uh, practitioners yeah. in the field that I'm in. And it literally took, it just, got, it happened like that. I didn't expect it. And like, that was really cool because like now I still talk to some of these people. I still have relationships with them. Yeah. And like these people who are world leading in certain part, in certain fields, all from one damn video. Where that, I said keto wasn't ideal for beginners in most cases. That was the whole point. <laughs> okay. And that, that, that yeah, so it can work. It's great for epilepsy. <laughs> like it was, it was cool. Like it was like, just that one small thing led to all that. And I teach my students the same thing now. Like if you have something valuable to say, say it. It's not a bad thing. Like if you get, like, oh, I have a podcast, but I don't really advertise it and I don't have guests on it. It's just me saying stuff. Like if I think about training, nutrition, mindset, it's very geared towards that. I probably got like 10 students from that. Really? See? Yeah. There you go. Yeah, I, I barely post it. Like I look at it, I haven't done anything like for a couple of months now. I'll get an email saying how many pe each week saying how many people listen to it or whatever. But hey, I heard I get an email like once every three weeks or something, four weeks saying, hey, I listen to your podcast. It's really cool. Can we have a chat? I'm like, sure, bro. Um, and then when I get these people's clients, like as clients, as students, like one guy um, saw me, I helped him out with some knee stuff. He then posted on his Facebook, I think, about how he helped the client with knee pain. Using your methods, yep. That, yeah, saw that going. He got four clients from that Facebook post, and he had this other lady posting it saying, oh, Matt, thanks so much for the knee. You've actually changed my life. And then she came back on as a client and brought two people with her. So he increased his income by, like, I think it worked out to be around $20,000 a year. By something he learned from yourself. From podcast, yeah, and then he got four other clients who he's helping with uh, all different knee issues, which is going to prevent surgery for I think three of them. Um, which is like you think about the co the consequences of that in terms of cost on the healthcare system, their personal well being, their employers' well being, uh, their employers like health funds and all the employment stuff that people have to deal with. Like it's ends up being quite a huge change. And you think that, about the impact of that. Yeah. You don't ever, you just go, oh, cool, it's a client from a podcast. Well, it's a client from a podcast, but it's a client who, of course, of the lessons I've been able to disperse has done A, B, C, D, E, which has helped these people, which has helped these people. Wow, one person can make a difference. Absolutely. And that's just, there's unlimited examples of that. Like that exists every day, all the time in life, which is a beautiful thing. What was the yeah. actual the principle that you taught him in? or that you explained in that podcast about uh, knee pathology. I didn't talk about knee pathology in that podcast. I didn't know what podcast he listened to. Oh. I didn't even, uh, he just, uh, he, he signed up for my mentoring program. I was like, cool, awesome. Uh, let's have a chat. And he was asking something about knee stuff. And I think I literally just taught him um, easy solve for knee pain is to look at when someone gets pain relative to staircases. He's like, what? I'm like, if they're going downstairs, it's generally uh, eccentric overload of the rectus femoris. If it's pain going upstairs, it's uh, they have muscle skeletal weakness in the posterior chain. Pick your strategy based on that and you can do that really quickly. That's pretty good. And he was like, all right, cool, I'll do that. And then um, he implemented it. And of course, they're all fairly simple cases. It worked for all those simple cases. Wow. That's good. So I was like, cool. That's that a very good. simple test that anyone could do. That's really good. Yeah, basic rule of thumb. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just make a little note of that. Like, <laughs> you know, because you can problem solve solutions without even seeing somebody necessarily. 
um, more like just um, I guess for me because I've, I've been doing this for so long and uh, so obsessive about it. It's kind of like you learn the you nearly learn the you know life stories, right? Everyone has their story. Hmm. Stories what make change. Like Black Lives Matter. When we're talking about that, it's a story of the guy who had his neck being pressed down on. We also the stories that apply to injuries. Like there's the common story of the injury. It's not. It's not looking at people. And I, I don't care about their orthopedic presentation off the bat. Like I'm not like looking at what's wrong. I'm like, what's the story of the injury? What's the injury? Tell me about the injury. Let me know what it's telling you. And then. I, people are like, oh yeah, I'll go for a walk and it'll be okay. And then after 10 minutes in, it'll hurt. I'm like, cool, well, you got some endurance issues. Like we need to look at that. Um, it, the story guides the assessment. Interesting, yeah. Well said, the story guides the assessment because you bring context to the to the situation. Yeah. Um, I, there's so many, there's so many things, Paul, that I want to talk to you about, um, but I want to be respectful of your time too. But, the reason, well, I wanted to talk, go back to dogmas real quick. And what's something that you've changed your mind about that you were previously really dogmatic about? That's what that's what came to my mind before. Oh, what field do you want to talk about, man? Like, um, I used to oh, it's that, man. Like, okay, here's one. Um, functional movement. The functional, term? Uh, so, when I started in the fitness to give me that, to give context to the story of the story um i train up my first trainer that i hired he like won the 2001 training a year i hired him because i couldn't i couldn't bench press i couldn't over, overhead press or bench press because when i was 16 i got my shoulder messed up by a crappy gym instructor who gave me like ridiculous amounts of volume for pressing because you need a big chest bro and like i couldn't i could only incline press and very light weights and I remember he, I was like, look, I need to get back to training properly. I want to train people eventually. And he gave me like a standing cable push, like a pull check. Yeah. I could barely do 3.75 kilos and I was gassed after 12 reps. I was like dripping in sweat. I'm like, how the hell are you killing me? Like, what is this nonsense? And sure enough, I got out of pain maybe six to eight weeks and I could start pressing eight weeks later, which was cool. But then I was doing the bench press. I had those negative associations there. And I was like, oh, functional exercise is better because it gets you out of pain, which kind of led to the thing that functional exercise and being able to move your body way it's meant to be moved without context of what the goal was became a more noble training pursuit than, say, bodybuilding or powerlifting yeah. or whatever training goal it was. So that um, had, it had its benefits and its uh, downsides. It made me very good at figuring out it helped me get really good at figuring out what was going on with people who were in pain and helping solve those issues out. What it did, it made me neglect body composition type training and bodybuilding type training, hypertrophy stuff, powerlifting stuff, like traditional strength athlete, barbell sport athlete stuff for a very, very long time. And to kind of look down my nose at it as being a less noble or less mm. involved way of looking at training. And when you do that, like you look at people like Paul Check, for example, that's kind of... How his communication is anyway. Yeah, do you think the poliquins and the checks that they that they've kind of communicated like that most of their life, right? <laughs> yeah, but this way of training is better because it serves their dogma. Hmm. Like, and that was something that for ages it kind of was like, no, nah, I can't build. Like, it led to an belief system. Like, I'm not a big guy. I can't build muscle. I can't get jacked. And uh, that changed very quickly when I started bodybuilding properly. But it was something that I used that influence to then work with my clients and like where I would look at, listen to their goals and they'd be like, Oh, I want to do this. And I would subconsciously and sometimes consciously steer the conversation towards, Hey, wouldn't you prefer to be doing this? Mm. Because it has all these benefits and none of these downsides. So for me, that was a big, a big one to realize that, yeah, that was something that I did a lot of the time where I probably sure I helped at the time people get out of pain and that's where I kind of made, my name but i held back a lot of people in achieving a goal that was important to them and then i used the misguided definition of what functionality is to drive a lot of my decisions for a very long period of time hmm. nutrition wise it was a long time and like very paleo type era i was like oh yeah everyone needs to eat paleo because that's how we evolved we certainly didn't evolve with uh meat and nut breakfast unless we were <laughs> hunters and we were nuts <laughs> 
it was like, oh, you need to eat paleo, you need to do this, you need to eat this way, you need to eat organic. And that was very much a check thing. And that's the most important thing nutritionally for everyone. So if you're not eating organic, you're not doing the best you can for yourself. Mm. And again, that was a dogma that wasn't, I don't know, we probably don't know enough about the difference between organic and conventional yet to say which one's better or not in the long term. Um, there's data that's mixed, but it probably wasn't the most helpful thing for, say, a single mum with three kids to keep. To put to somewhere, if you want to consider, like, where are we going to put her mental resources and things to be concerned about health wise? That's probably not the first place we're going to start. Yeah. So, we, uh, that, those dogmas there, as two of them were things that didn't really serve me. Another one would be that sales are bad. What do you mean? Sales is not why I do this. I'm all about doing sales and all that kind of stuff. Like, sales was one where a concept of running a business where I was kind of like, it's people will come and see us. We don't need to spend much time on the sale because if they don't want to train with us, they don't want, they don't want to work with us. That's it. They're not serious. They're not understanding that didn't really respect all the different uh, psychological resources that go into making a decision and then understanding whether it's a right or wrong decision. And then also the sales opportunity. One thing that did change that was looking at was an opportunity to change and ambivalence to change rather than it's a sale. So getting out of that mindset where, oh, cool, I'm, I'm being sleazy and being a salesman or whatever, that's that's bullshit, that's incorrect. It's finding a person who has resistance, they have ambivalence to changing. They're already there, they're already interested, they're in pre-contemplation. Changing my mindset around that allowed me to help a ton more people because if I look back at it now, there's probably a bunch of people that I didn't really try with or I didn't really spend the time with, which I could have really helped them with other stuff. How did so you, by having all these, you go, sorry. I just wanted to know um, how you change that mental framework towards selling and how you see it now. Well, how, how I see it now is probably a little bit different to there because you know, I run a business by myself now, et cetera, and I have staff that rely on me. But what I, how I kind of looked at was it was a very long process. So. I never did sales very much when I was a one-on-one -on -one PT when I started DC because it was kind of like, I just, I, I ran off referrals. So when you're running off referrals entirely, you don't, you're not really doing a sale. Referrals pre-sold. Yeah. It's the only thing you deal with is like, the question you get is, oh, cool. I've heard from my friend that you're awesome. How much is it? Yeah. Cool. All right. How many times? One, two, three. It's a very simple process. When running a gym, and particularly the space where at DC, to give you an idea, it was 700 square meters, and it was all semi-private PT. Like that, you need to sell a lot to fill that. It's a that's a big pick personal training facility, 700 square meters, um, with 12 staff that need to be that needed clients. So, former business, he he really got into the sales side, and I feel like he got into it he kind of lost sight a little bit of the helping people part of the sales. It was more about the hitting the KPIs and getting the numbers in. And he learned some sales techniques from one person or one coach that I found to be very, very sleazy and very um, like, hi, is that Alex? Oh, you're the man I'm looking for. Like very, very inorganic, very mm. inauthentic mm. way of doing it. So that kind of, I was like, you know what, you do that side, I'll deal with people when they actually get in here and I'll help people like that. And it's kind of like, what I'm doing is more noble than what you're doing because I'm actually helping people. You're just a salesman. He was helping people just as much as I was because he was giving them the opportunity to be helped. Yeah. So what happened was after a period of time, because a lot of people would come in because some of the sales did but one Just broke up a little bit there, Paul. <laughs> You think the program is oh, i have no idea I'm like, okay there's a disconnect there so what i did i had to learn to sell those people on the spot and the way i ended up learning how to do it was like all right cool what's your story story what's your reason for being here what's your why if we uncover your why and then the service is there it's a we can then help sell you in a very authentic caring communicative way and all we're doing is just allowing you to exchange your time and money for something that you want Hmm. I see. So it's a big. So it took, it took a while. 
but it is a big mental flip and framework. And once you realize that we're all, we're all, we're all sell, we all do it, whether we realize it or not. Yeah. You know, whether you're on a yeah. date with somebody. There was a book I read that helped thank you as well. Was, uh, you're selling yourself. Mm-hmm. If you're on a date, you're selling the idea of being with that person. Like that's all it is. So I read the book called To Sell as Human by Daniel Pink. And that was quite a big framework shift because it was like, if you go to a doctor, it mentions that the diagnosis is it's selling you that you need to do something. Everything is a sale. That was the, um, and just because it's a sale doesn't mean it's necessarily bad. It's just, you're trying to persuade someone to, uh, making a change. Right. Uh, usually a change that they have come to you to create. They've come to you to create. So all you're doing is facilitating that process to happen and you're just informing them the fact that they're going to be exchanged in that, which is fair <laughs> because you should, people should get paid for, for creating that change for someone. We're not here to, we have to do that. Like in the ideal, we, live, we could just do stuff for free, but you know, money is going to be a part of that exchange and just realizing that, that that's just energy transforming. Exactly. It's just a transfer of resources, you know, solving problem, resource transfer. Um, the reason we're actually having this conversation that I wanted to ask you about as well um, the reason I like prompted I gotta gotta hit up Paul you know I'm gonna speak to him um, was because I saw your really really good post on cheat meals and you had Dwayne Johnson uh, on the photos which people love to quote and put up and even I love that I looked at his meat cheat meals and I'm like bro is your gastrointestinal tract like like double the size of the average person I'm like yeah probably Um, but just the sheer amount of volume of food he pumps through his body. Not every day. This is not how he eats, but just on like one, maybe two meals a week. Uh, I didn't see your second post on it, but I'd love for you to dive into just having like an uh, uh, open conversation now, back and forth on why the term and approach towards cheat meals may be particularly deleterious psychologically to one's mental health or relationship with food and beyond okay cool so yeah relationship with food is something that i i feel like my bias towards it is a relationship with food is much more important than any kind of calorie or macro prescription that you can give uh, because number one thing for achieving a kind of body composition was goal if we're going to go down that path is adhering to a plan like people have had success in all different types of plans. It's the ones that you can stick to that will generally work for the best for the long term. So, you know, I said the relationship with your dogmas is the longest one that you'll ever have. Mm. Longest lasting relationship. Relationship with foods probably uh, lasts a bit longer because uh, you, you know, from the moment you're, you're a baby and you have your first bit of breast milk, you're starting your relationship with food. Mm. Uh, there's an emotional connection with food from the first uh, mouthful that you have. And then like relationship food makes up a part of every single birthday, every single social celebration, every big moment in life, food is involved in it. So there's a relationship there. So when a lot of people have us suffer, have a thing called disordered eating, which isn't an eating disorder. Eating disorder is thing like anorexia, nervosia, bulimia, they need to go deal with a mental health professional. It's like, that's a real issue. Disordered eating is eating behaviors that aren't, basically the opposite of normal eating behaviors and normal eating behaviors. I know that's making a little bit of a judgment, but it's a good set of guidelines to go from. So if someone's relationship with food is if they use food as an emotional crutch, meaning when they're stressed, they eat when their relationship goes to shit, they eat when work sucks, they eat. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of prescription we've given that client, what kind of meal plan they have, what their intentions are at the beginning of the week, because as soon as they get upset or anything happens, they're going to reach for that bowl of ice cream, which is going to destroy uh, body composition progress. If we particularly just keep in mind caloric balance throughout the course of a training, uh, course of a week, uh, there's a whole bunch of other forms of disordered eating, but we won't delve into them now. But the whole idea with the cheat meal is the cheat meal is you're, first of all, you're giving food a psychological, uh, a moral value. Food doesn't have a moral value. Food, well, we won't go into the animal versus plant-based eating, but food <laughs> in general doesn't have a moral value. Like a pack of Doritos is not necessarily evil. Right. Like a pack of Doritos aren't burning kids in the street. 
uh, they just food. they just sit there. Whereas an apple does the exact same thing, right? Um, so it gives an idea that food has a moral value. So if you're having a bad meal like pizza, you're a you're a bad human, mm. which isn't really really helpful. Um, next thing with a cheat meal is it puts people into the idea that they deserve it. People like it's kind of like a conditioning thing. Oh, I had a hard day. I need. Uh, I, I deserve this. Like I used to do it every day. I'd work 14 hours, which was most days at the beginning parts of DC. If I needed petrol for the car, if I go to the service station, I'd buy an ice cream on the way. Cause I'm like, I deserve it. I work 14 hours. Mm. It's like, I'm not a dog. I'm not a dog being trained. Um, <laughs> so that was, that's one aspect of the cheat meal. The third thing is it, it teaches people to actively ignore a, a mindful approach to eating it's actively ignoring the fact that you're full it's actively ignoring the fact that you uh eating a, you're not you're giving into a craving and totally giving up to it rather than controlling that craving you're not controlling the impulses anymore you are at a slave to that meal so like i posted a thing on my um page about a uh, day with all the calories that a standard cheat day could be hmm. Uh, and I think it worked out to be 9,271 calories. Yeah. Pretty good day, right? Um, and I have clients get in this mindset that they can use cheat meal as a way to psychologically cope with having to eat well for the majority of the week. Yet they look at the scale and they're like, why is nothing happening? I eat well. Well, do you? Like you're eating, <laughs> you're eating well. You're unnecessarily restricting yourself from having this food and feeling like shit for the whole week to then reward yourself on one one day of the week where all your progress and every area of your health and fitness which you're trying to move forward with, you're setting back. You're not just going back to neutral, you're going past it. Mm. So I think the whole concept of a cheat meal doesn't, a cheat day, it really doesn't help anyone. The only day I would ever recommend it Four is if someone's like literally trying to gain a shit ton of weight, which isn't really most people who come see me, let's be honest. Um, so I think some psychologically, it gets rid of mindful eating, which is a, proven to be a really good way of maintaining your weight. It, it People giving into cravings and just going all out, which psychologically limits the amount of grit they have in their diet and their ability to um, delay gratification. So another important psychological construct. It's metabolically quite damaging, which is uh, something else that we need to be aware of. And then it's also inherent. It's putting a moral value onto foods, mm. uh, which is crazy. Well, it so worsens no the psychological moral. relationship someone has with food when you when you attain a moral value. Like, well, yes, chemically, this food may be more. Uh, it may have more sustenance for your biology. That's correct, right? But the moral value of good or bad or guilt or no guilt is an interesting thing that we do. And I want to know what is your alternative then to that, you know, for, for me, because I used to have cheat meals, right? I used to approach it that way as many people do, right? You're going to, you have an opportunity where you can just open the floodgates. But... Now being introduced, um, I'm working with Ben Kant, who's a Melbourne-based uh, biochemist and coach, who's really amazing, and he doesn't call them that. And I think you may have a similar thing. He has flexible calories slash refeed calories, right? And this basically Control is... Indulgences. Say again? Controlled indulgences. Exactly. Is another word. Can you, you, can you go ahead and, and speak about the alternative to, to cheap meals? Yep, sure. Um, it, the... Construct that I'll use in communicating it will determine on the client's uh, makeup, I guess. So if a client is a very logical, analytical person, like their numbers base, like say you're working with a cliche, an accountant type person. Some people, I've got one client who really smart, um, she's doing a PhD, she's doing all these things all in one go. She literally maps out her food four weeks in advance to the gram. And she'll fit in, this is when pizza's happening, this is when tacos are happening, this is when whatever's happening. Her four-week transformations on my Instagram, she lost like a ton of centimeters while still having pizza and tacos and nachos and stuff like that every week. She, because she's so analytical and so mathematical, I spent time with her 
educating her about energy balance yeah. as a base construct. So if someone's like that and she fairly healthy relationship with food psychologically, I was like, all right, cool. We're going to go down that energy path, flexible dieting pathway. For her, that's really, really useful. Uh, for other clients, what I might do is I go, all right, cool. Let's deal with the energy balance of a cheat meal but let's do it in a way where it doesn't affect the rest of your day, where we still hit a few guidelines. So you feel like you're not blowing it out. Yeah. I'll give them like a protein and plant target for the day. All right, hey, look, um, as long as you have protein and plants and you have this many servings throughout the day, I don't care what you do at night when you go out. It'll probably, it'll probably balance itself out. So for those people, they'll have breakfast. It'll be like eggs and spinach and it'll be a pretty boring day up until that point but they'll be quite full because they're having high satiety foods, proteins and greens. And then they have their cheat meal and they move on. And that's how we deal with life. We don't think any more about that. If someone is really struggling with the psychological component of dieting and they use food as a way to punish themselves or reward themselves or make themselves feel comfortable, mm. a lot of the time with them is not even worrying about the energy balance components of it. It's more about teaching them the ability to get back from a setback. So it's never the setback, it's the problem. It's the ability and time that it takes someone to come back from that setback and turn it from a blip rather than being a blip on the radar and being an explosion. Mm. But I'm sure you've come across some clients before when they have a, they, they've got all these ideals and goals of eating really, really healthy and then they, they eat something and they're like, they have that and they just blow everything out, right? All right. They just go out of control. They're like, oh, I've already had the chips. I may as well eat this, eat this, eat this, eat that. For those clients, it's more about teaching them the skills of emotional self-regulation of self-compassion. And when it does happen to be able to go, it's okay that I've done this. Everyone's done that. Yeah. It's more about, it's my, it's, it's like I'm Victor Frankl. Uh, it's your response to the situation your emotional response, which you are in control of and you can dictate. For those clients, I, ha I spend most of my time teaching that. So I'll leave it, yeah, to answer the question succinctly, it's three approaches. I go to the flexible diet, energy balance scenario. Mm -hmm. I go to set the targets and let them enjoy that meal and move on. If they're like moderately normal, not overly analytical, and if someone's more emotionally, emotionally struggling with it, I'll be more interested in looking at teaching them emotional self-regulation strategies because it's a better use of their time rather than getting them stressed out about energy balance and stuff like that. That is a very comprehensive and succinct approach, I think. And I think that describes the, the nuance of this conversation, right? Of that not most people are not going to respond well if they do what Dwayne Johnson does every week. Do It works for Dwayne Johnson because he has dialed in exactly the 95% of other habits he needs to maintain. Yeah. And, you know, I also think there's an element of guilt to it, right? I've experienced it. I've had some pretty restrictive protocols in the past through, through gut health protocols, um, for example, that have altered and negatively affected my relationship with food because I have to be very restrictive. Now, coming out of those over the years, like I, I, I feel like I'm fortunate where... I can enjoy and plan. It's different now. It's like I'm planning to have a restaurant bought meal that may be may have uh, gluten or dairy or maybe a like something maybe a bit more gluttonous, but I can still enjoy it because well, this is my plan, right? This is not I'm not uh, I'm not just throwing all caution to the wind, yeah. right? It's controlled indulgence for you. Yeah. yeah. There you go. That, that's your phrase, controlled indulgence. But how do we get to the place where people cannot feel guilty about controlled indulgence or rather, yeah, remove the guilt away from certain foods? I think that's the, um, it's the self-compassion angle again. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I see, I picked that because it comes up again and again, because let's use you an example. Um, cool. You've had some gut health issues, correct? Correct. Cool. Uh, you probably, I'm assuming there's a few other people in the world that have had gut health issues, correct? Uh, just majority. Just majority, right? Yeah. Cool. Uh, I'm assuming a few people, I'm sure you at one point for gut health 
issues, you've been a little bit uh, frustrated by the restriction that your diet's been placed places upon you. Extremely. I'm assuming you feel limited by it, right? Very. Limited by it and like, why me? Like, this sucks, man. There's other people out having burgers and stuff. Why? It's not me. This is shit, right? right. Cool. Um, you're the only person that ever felt that? Absolutely not. Nah, man. So is it really that bad that you do feel that? Probably not. Is it really bad that you've gone off track? No, because it's no, a moment. No, everyone else has done it. It's sure it set you back a little bit, but you're not dead. So that's the skill of self-compassion at that point is go, okay, cool. Common humanity. I've done it. Everyone else has done it. Well, not everyone, but a vast majority of people have done it. Then it's like, how do you want to talk to yourself after that? Yeah. Do you want to be like, Alex, man, I hate you. How dare you do that? You've ruined everything. You're a terrible human being. Or do you want to be speak to yourself how your best friend would speak to you? Man, it's cool. Like it happened. Let's just pick back, pick it up, put our socks back on, let's move forward. Yeah. Then it's like then it's like being then the last element of self-compassion is being mindful. So that's then teaching you the skill to then recognize that when it is happening, it's happening. And then at that point, you have the choice to go, cool, okay, I can now control this or I'm going to lose control. And if you don't get it right the first go, like some people might, but most people don't get it right the first go. They, they get reminded of it and they remind themselves they're aware of it. All right, cool, I'm mindful now. No, I'm going to keep going. Or I'm mindful now. All right, I'm going to stop. And once you get to that first point where you've realized that you're going into a binge or you're feeling something about it and you've made that conscious decision, pardon me, conscious, conscious decision. So you, you sound like a smart guy. Or like, <laughs> I can't uh, conscious decision yeah. to stop that. That's when self-compassion has now started to shift and you've started to go into a different mindset around food and that will that's really important because it's not just going to apply to food food it's god i'm really struggling it's i need caffeine it's not just applying to food it's applying to everything then because the skills that i like to teach nutritionally aren't just like hey man this is how you measure a chicken breast mm. that stuff's cool but it's like hey if you learn to be self-compassionate in one area of life and be mindful of what's happening with food for example it's highly likely, although not guaranteed, but very likely that you'll start to develop self-compassion in your study habits yeah. or your work habits or your sleep habits or whatever habit it is. And then you can generally when we learn something and we embody it, we can then apply it to other principles and other areas of life really quickly. Absolutely. And you can be like, oh man, I'm on my phone. It's 11 o'clock. I'm looking at memes again. Hmm. And I can keep going or I can go be aware of it and go to bed. Like it becomes a, it's a skill set that becomes part of who people are. That's great. That's well said. Um, I think when you incorporate that into your daily practice, where it's like, I think we live in a culture now that loves to thrive off who can suffer the most is the most superior, right? Yeah. The person who sleeps the less has the least amount of fun and joy and entertainment. No. You will not watch a movie. What? TV hey, show? Video you have a video yeah. game? What? Stop it. No. You have to work all the time, every moment, forever. And if you're not meditating, you, you <laughs> go home. Go away. If you're, you're not, not meditating, you don't, you're not fasting, and you're not taking some type of MCT oil in your coffee, then well, your name's yeah. not Tim Ferriss. You're having coffee with caffeine in it? You're weak. Right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's we. It's this whole like I feel like Gary V's like whole crush it mentality has kind of been distorted a little bit. Yeah, because he doesn't mean that. He knows he's he's lying between the sentences. This is not for everybody. It's like this is not meant to be for everybody. No, and it's not meant to be forever either. It, yeah, great point. Um, and that's where we get where you think we get into this uh, ideal and this mindset where it's like, man, if I'm not crushing it and doing stuff towards my my goals whether professional, personal, or spiritual, every moment of every waking day, then I'm falling behind from other people. And, and we need to recharge our batteries, hey. Like, the irony is that when we do start behaving like that and start feeling that way and then beating ourselves up about it, i.e. lacking self-compassion, when we do have the fall, the fall is greater. It's always greater. 
It's when you see people who work like, you know, oh. 90, 100, 140 hours a week will go to insane amounts. When they quit, stop working, it's because they crash and they crash, they crash hard. Do you know Todd Jarrett? Have you heard of his story? No, sorry, I haven't. Oh, okay. Uh, that basically, if you have time, I want to listen to an intro, a podcast that, that describes that exactly. Todd Jarrett, a New South Wales based um, coach, was living his life like that. Um, young coach, similar age to me. Balls to wall every day, all the time. And he's basically, long story short, ulcerative colitis has nearly killed him um, multiple times. Been in hospital, lost so much of his gains. And it makes me think, and I'm going to say when I speak to him next, all this time that we think we're put, well, the only time we're putting in now to be productive and for future uh, prosperity, right? The sacrifice, quote unquote, we're making now for the future. If not managed intelligently, we end up losing all that time that we think we're saving through having to save our life and health when it eventually, inevitably crashes. Yes, it catches us and it catches us every time. I haven't had ulcerative of colitis, but I've had times where I've just, I remember once I was like doing like the ridiculously long days and my back just seized up. Yeah. upper back and i was like who the hell gets an upper back seizure and i laid down and i woke up a day later and i was like what the f- like what the hell happened and i my phone was like full of messages from clients and people and all that stuff going where were you i was like i was gone like i, I had to have three days off work couldn't move i was like the hell was the point of that so a whole bunch of new clients that were pissed off gained training etc you get sick, it, it just always comes back and gets you. So any of these really extreme approaches, like where we try and be like, I can tolerate this. It it sets most people back pretty much all the time. There's always the outliers, like there's a David Goggins, for example, right? Yeah, so that but, guy's a freak. Yeah, but we need to stop for David as well. Like he is vested heavily in his health. He stretches for two hours a night, every night. That's his leisure and recovery. Like he's taking care of recovery too. And he's also had uh, a bunch of a uh, bunch of injuries as well. Like exactly. Him, but I think the value is in the lessons of people like Gary Vee and David Goggins and Jocko will I can't pronounce his surname. Um, is not it's not the fact of what they do. It's not what they do because what they do is what they do. Mm. It's the mindset behind what they teach, which is things like grit, resilience, push through discomfort. It doesn't mean you have to then try and copy their schedules in their lives because like uh, David Goggins, he was in the military, right? Mm-hmm. Navy, oh, SEAL. Totally different. Totally different. Navy SEAL, totally different to running an online business. <laughs> like, But the totally approach different. and the mentality can be synonymous and have common commonality. Yeah, but you don't behave in the same way. Like, it's just crazy. Like, a person who's never run before, like he was a Navy SEAL, they had to run. A person who's never run before starts doing that, of course they're going to blow something out. It's a volume issue yeah it's we look at these people and who are a little bit more aesthetic and they've gotten their life to that point because for them that's their own spiritual journey as much as it is their physical journey like for them there's a very spiritual aspect to what they're doing it's kind of like how monks meditate all the time doesn't mean that like that's their spiritual journey that for their life it's not for us to do but there's definitely lessons and mindset ideas and philosophies we can take away from that and apply it to us just we don't need to glorify that right and we don't need to we can't build up to people think also forget like david goggins Jocko, all those people it took them years to get to that point they didn't just wake up one day and go that's it that's a life of work it's a life of work and that's the life that they've chosen and all the more power to them um it's when we start boasting about how oh, i've been sleeping only and then you know, I've become an entrepreneur. I'm hustling every minute of the day. That's when things go backwards. And then when we start denying fun, that's because they probably find what they do fun anyway. Exactly. This is a big point. I think I've, in my journey through basketball, through getting obsessed with that and trying to take it as far as possible in my life, I was, and I think this is really important in, in one's life to experience, life is supposed to be imbalanced in a lot of ways sometimes. It's not always going to be harmony and balance, especially when you're young. And so I think that's important to experience. So I experienced that and I and I experience it in a way still today where there's a lot of imbalance, where it's just 
when when I when you go at something, you attack it fully and wholeheartedly, right? And that was my life for a lot of period of time, and I think that's what your life was, Paul, for a lot of period of time, right? right. But now I'm starting to realize, and I realize this through my relationship, especially, is oh, I don't just have to be a slave to my goals and outcomes and habits and ho- like. I don't just have to be do that. Like I can experience and enjoy and take joy and fun out of life too. Like why not? I want that. I want to live a life that is joy filled, not just um, success filled or meaning filled uh, superficially as well. I I want something where I can experience joy, where I can have no guilt about enjoying things that I enjoy like reading and entertainment. I love movies. They're like drugs for me. Like take me to new worlds and like I love that. Like I watch silly shit that I laugh at like The Simpsons I think is iconic and incredible. Like yes. things like that. Now I'm at that place now. I feel so liberated and I'm still able to be successful in my fields that I'm doing at because when I'm here and when you're here, Paul, when you coach, you're on. When you run your business, when you're doing your 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 artificial intelligence, that is laser focus. But when you're doing something else when I'm enjoying something with my girlfriend uh, like a uh, like a entertainment I'm laser focused on that that is f- I'm fully experiencing it yeah our brain has the our brain has like this unlimited capacity it just doesn't have the unlimited capacity to do the one thing only it needs variation yeah it's like you can easily you can be exhausted people say oh I can't focus anymore I've had a hard day at work that's a lot of crap because as soon as you play a video game after about 10 minutes, you're like this, you're fully engrossed that your brain has the resources to do that. You do, it's just being able to intelligently disperse that over the multiple interests that you have, which makes you a more well-rounded person anyway. And I actually, you've spoken to Lachlan Wilmot before, right? Yes. Yeah. Cause he's, um, well, his, podcast, to Elfic podcast. Yeah, and he's, um, with a- a- a. Mm. um, he's, I remember him, I remember him when he was my first mentoring student. I heard that, which is actually, I'd love to talk about that, but keep doing what you're saying. He, uh, when he was younger, when he started working, he was very driven. Like 20, it's not often you have like a very young, like 18, 19 year old going, I'm going to work in professional sports. Yeah. Recognition coach. It's not often. It doesn't happen like that. And he was very driven, like really, really driven, really on the ball. Uh, and after a number of years, I remember seeing him write something in some article because I always follow what he's doing. And he wrote down what's one of the most valuable things that you can learn. And he's like, man, it's learning not just to be a coach the whole time yeah. and not just being obsessed and actually having some interest. And they're like, why? And he's like, because I can now talk my athletes. I can now actually develop a relationship with my athletes, talk to them about shit like having a girlfriend, having a boyfriend, playing a video game, watching a movie, what's happening in the world. And I get, I'm effectively now a better coach because I've got a wider range of experiences to draw from. Because like, you know, me, like I was hyper-focused, like it sounds like you're a basketball. I would be up late studying and learning anatomy and biomechanics up early at work. Do I study before work, which was insane thinking of it now i'd go to work i'd study in breaks or i'd train it was like seven days a week that was it that was the grind that was it and i, I really enjoyed it like I, but after a period of time it's like cool friendships where are they eh, no they're not there talking to clients about stuff that's not this when they start talking about their life i'm like i don't know what you're talking about yeah. i have no i have no idea how to relate to people and when you're a coach it's not about as a holistic coach, it's not about holistic, not like saying we have to rake them every day or anything. We have to be able to understand where people are coming from. Just having that ability to see the world from a slightly different perspective, which is follows back to our conversation earlier. It makes you better and more effective in pretty much every area of your life. Yeah, you become a better human. Yes. So now all my relationships with everybody are better, right? I'm less neurotic. I'm I'm more mentally uh, i am healthier but I feel that the neurotic thing i feel that you, you still uh, now i feel like not being as neurotic right so but much it, better. absolutely but it's 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 like i think for certain types of people like it's it lingers right it's always a, like a like a i don't know like a, a line you gotta just keep at bay from taking you over 
Yep. And you need to have self-compassion to then go, it's, yes. a, it's a cool, like everyone who's been successful or everyone who's been really driven towards goals probably had let take over them at one point. Yes. They probably had a friend or hopefully they've had a friend or someone nearby to say, dude, it's cool. You can have a nap or you can go, let's go have a beer or whatever yeah. it is. And to bring that, just have a normal conversation about normal shit and do something that's normal. It's so, it's like when you come back to what you're passionate about and what you want to achieve, exactly like you said, you're like, let's hit this laser. Yeah. Let's nail this shit. And I don't have to get to the point where I destroy my health. It's so ironic that in the health industry, so many of us health professionals, we end up having such poor health because we're trying to help other people's health. We're our worst clients. <laughs> right? And that, okay. that contradiction led me to stop posting on Strength of Saad, which is my social media page, um, where I did all my health and wellness stuff. Because I'm like, what am I doing? I'm, I'm, I'm a contradiction. Like, I need to transform myself physically, uh, mentally, before I can come back to the world um, and, and talk about these things. I just think we live contradictions all the time like that. Yes, we do. It's just recognizing them and then being mindful enough to then make a better decision next time. Exactly. Now, Paul. Yes. Funnily, you said to me uh, when we were messaging and organizing this, um, my podcasts usually end up going pretty long. And that's kind of what's happened here. You know, I want to be uh, cognizant of your time. Do you want to wrap up around here? Or are you open just to finish off? um, Now 10, 20 minutes? Sure thing. Easy done. Um, So yeah, I think to clarify... Hard work is critically important. I don't, we don't want to like stray away that of the conversation of like you know uh, hard work isn't important. Like that's it's so important. I think you have to enter realms of your life where you're really imbalanced and you're really balls to wall, and you don't have any of those things in order to come to these realizations and almost earn it, if if you will. Uh, do you, do you find that or no? Yeah, there's sometimes that you have to go balls to wall, and that's I think that's okay. Yeah. Like, if you want to, um, I think about this. I'll, I'll, I actually think about this topic a fair bit. Um, Nick, I think I'm similar to you in that way. I think we probably both spent too much time thinking. Um, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, it's, it's it's a good place to be. Um, <laughs> not the worst problem to have, let's be honest. Um, like, some I deal with a lot of people who have normal jobs, let's say a normal career, like nine to five, whatever hours it is. And they're really happy. Their place of security, they've got good money, they've got all these type of things in. And then the egoistic judging part of me goes, well, what are, what are they striving for? Like, what are they, yeah. they could be- You compare, you know what? There's a trap because you compare, and I've done this, you compare your values to their values. Exactly, that's where it is. It's like, well, their values are uh, a little bit different. Does that? Uh, are my values inherently superior? No, yeah. they're not just different. Yeah. Um, so for those people, like people in that kind of mindset, and my wife's a perfect example. She's very, she's got a great career. It's really comfortable for her in a number of ways. And it allows her to indulge all her other interests at the same time. So she can have quite a wide variety of interests uh, and still work. And well, before COVID, like a lot of travel. Yeah and see all over the world and there's things that interest her and sometimes she comes to me with like doubt saying oh am i doing enough i'm like i like i could could be doing more i'm like but you you're doing all the things that you want yeah exactly it's like what do you want all your outcomes she's like oh i'm just comparing myself negatively to other people i'm like well you don't need to do that and so that's like one flip side of that with the hard work because sometimes I will feel guilty for comparing myself or for thinking about oh, cool, other people are in this situation where it's great. Here I am at, you know, seven o'clock on the Sunday night putting something together because I've had this flash of inspiration that I want to do this thing right now to help do this, to help these people in this particular context. Like quite often I'll go for a walk and I'm like, ah, oh, shit, I need to put that into the mentoring program. And they do it now because the inspiration is struck. Mm-hmm. Um, and, it took me a while to realize that, hey, it's okay. Because I burnt out so many times. I tried to manage my time, my energy, my resources to a very strict point and go, yeah, I'm never going to work hard again, like all that hard. But flip side is that doing that really hard work can be really valuable. Yes. 
It's needed. It can be really valuable and it gives you, you can, if you, I feel like the way I've got to it now, if I can get it to a point where it kind of respects and follows and flows with my natural ebbs and flows of energy, creativity, inspiration, and focus, you can kind of get the best of both worlds mm. where you don't feel guilty about, say, I bought um, Last of Us 2 on PlayStation 4 and I finished yeah. that over the weekend. Like a, oh, you went I, in, Paul. I went in. I went in deep and then I came out an emotional wreck. Um, but like those experiences, they're like... I just... I don't, people like demonize video games now and I had to distance myself because they can get addicted pretty easily. But it's like... I mean, you were fully in that and you had a great experience in that. That was your intent. Yeah, it was my intent. And I was like, cool, I don't need to feel guilty about actually indulging in an entertainment slash story for that period of time. Has it really detracted from my goals? Probably not. But then at the same time, when I have a moment where I'm like, I need to do this for work, I need to create, I need to do something, I'm on and I'm on and it's okay to work really goddamn hard as long as I just communicate to the other people around me that this is what's going on. Look, I've got this idea. It's incredible or whatever it is. I'm going to be doing all this. I'm going to be doing it for roughly this period of time. I'll communicate to the people around me because I want them to know that I'll probably let down if they have let them down if they have higher expectations of me at that time. Mm. But when I'm in the other times, it's like, cool, I'm go- if I'm going to shut down and relax them, I'm going to shut down and relax them. I think that's the big point is intent. And that's because it's like, are you having that quote unquote cheat meal? Because you're, you know, this is just some random sporadic emotion that you're fulfilling. Or are you doing the thing because that is what you actually scheduled? Like, for example, scheduling leisure time. Like it's in the calendar. Yeah, do it. Scheduling work, scheduling workouts, scheduling everything. It's not like at a whim of a random emotion or like cravings, right? But it's purposeful. And I think once it's purposeful, you minimize a lot of the emotion, guilt uh, surrounding it. Yeah. Like I knew Last of Us 2 was coming out that weekend. Mm -hmm. And I was like, or that Friday, pardon me. And I was like, cool, I know I've got clients till 8.30. I know that I've scheduled into eat breakfast at 8 30 and at 8 45 i'm gonna walk down to the store i'm gonna buy i'm gonna walk back i'm gonna put it in and that's it i've scheduled it because yeah exactly and that was i was okay because i made that commitment and i think that's you've touched on a really good point there um for business owners entrepreneurs and people who do this type of work it's the scheduling in your leisure time being purposeful mindful and aware of it eliminates guilt yeah because you've given yourself a constraint for it to work within so like cal newport talks about it in um i think it's the, yeah it's in deep work not in so good you can't they can't ignore you where he schedules in he works incredibly hard he puts out a ton of stuff uh, and like papers in computer science like that's that stuff's intense but he schedules in leisure time every day from five o'clock onwards mm-hmm. he schedules every moment of it and like people say oh you're a bit neurotic and all that kind of stuff it, well why wouldn't we be a little bit neurotic with our time it's we've only got so much yeah it's the only commodity we can't we've get back for a certain amount it's the only commodity we, we're not going to get a refund on yeah. we can't change our mind with it go i didn't like how i spent that time can i get it back it's not going to happen but if we schedule our leisure time and we choose stuff like you you said you love movies right yes yeah like um Scheduling in two hours, two and a half, three hours, depending on the length of the film, to watch the film, if it's something that's really, if it's an amazing film, that is a very engrossing, rewarding time for you. Absolutely. And it can be also, like, I mean, this is... Yeah, yeah, sorry, just you you cut a little bit. Um, I'll wait for it to come back. All right, I think we're good. It's multifaceted though as well, where I just want to double check. You you can still hear me? Oh. Bo, 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 bo. That's Sydney internet. Yeah, Sydney internet sucks. <laughs> oh, now we're good. We're good. The multifaceted um uh benefit of entertainment and books and movies and TV shows is that if you pick the right one they can transform the way you actually look and interact with your world. Absolutely. 
they absolutely can. So like, um, Time to go out. Um, the new Nolan film. Which one? The, the Nolan, uh, Chris Nolan's new movie. It's the one where time inverts. Oh, I got uh, that. Looked good. It's, yeah. Um, it's one word in the title. It, Tenet. Yes. Jonathan, uh, David, Denzel Washington, Kids, the Star, and Twilight Guy. Yeah. Um, Sparkly Vampire. Yeah. Like that was, I like you know I went to that pre-release type thing. That was a really valuable, um, like if I, I've probably spent maybe about three hours thinking about that film since I watched it, hmm. thinking about the ideas and allowing, by thinking about that film, it became really valuable like for me because it then allowed me to clarify more what I like in terms of narrative structures, more what I enjoy about how, what films I want to watch from that because I was undecided about it. And that leisure time has literally allowed me to make better choices with my next amount of leisure time constantly refining it so i'm doing more and more stuff that i enjoy you know what it's like i just realized like we glorify books right like if you read you're obviously intellectual and you know you're sophisticated and you're genius, superior yeah. obviously well yeah, but movies and tv shows you're lazy and and you're a slob or you you or whatever right because you're not um because you're not engaging as much, you're, which is ridiculous because you think you're engaging more because you're uh, looking at it with your eyes and you're flicking the pages. Right. You, w- watching a movie, you're engaging not only with, you're watching it with your eyes as well. You're not flicking a page, but you're engaging with your ears. You're hearing what's going on. You're seeing the individual actors and characters motion. You're thinking, you can even think about like the actual complexity of the set pieces yeah. and how much organization how much went into actually developing that kind of stuff and the amount of creativity and thought processes and ways of looking in the world people have gone to make that stuff like that's inherently more valuable than a book and you learn stuff about human emotion right it just it adds a different and another layer to it and, and i just think like what's what's a what are what are these things what are these what are these mediums for inf- uh, for transferring they're transferring stories they're mediums to transfer stories right which books and television movies entertainment is well what's a movie it's a visual book it's a it's a visual book it started off with this with a screenplay which was written down so in that case we we're, we're obviously geniuses we're smarter than you <laughs> back in the stone age now, video game players are the next level now the especially virtual reality type business which is coming right yeah it is that's exciting Actually, I actually wanted to finish off on um, where you see one uh, the uh, what is it artificial intelligence software you're building, where you see that going, and what you want to create from it, and then what this book is that you're releasing. So artificial intelligence uh, it originally started the com- the the platform started off as gym management, and I wasn't involved in that at the beginning. Um, it's a guy who ran a whole bunch of gyms and he was very successful at running gyms. He's got a friend who did the AI for Google. Then they ended up having beer and like the genesis of all ideas, it started off in beer and men talking shit. Um, as usual. Yeah, as usual. That's how all great companies start, right? Mm. But I came on board because I was actually mentoring the gym owner through my assessment process, which I... He just wanted to show me the software, I think, because he probably wanted me to buy it in the future. And I said, oh, you can do this. And he's like, that's incredible. Uh, that could actually work. So where I see it going in the future is I want to see the health and fitness field transformed into a much more holistic I've been saying this word for so long now, much more holistic viewpoint where we can realize how everything kind of impacts everything else and into a structure where we can have something assist us in making better decisions and for our clients to get better outcomes. And for those clients, not just to be my clients that I train day to day, we're already at like 40 clubs at the moment um, who are using just the facility management software. Our goal is 20,000 and then all their members will be on that app, which will be what I'm developing. So it's looking at like a transformation of making fitness and health and wellness an objective decision-based making process. Because all the data is coming in, 
it will then basically, it's going to be, my goal for it is to become basically my own little research project. You're so, solving your own problem, it, I think is the best way to start a authentic, successful business. Um, yeah. But you're talking about it in a more macro way and it makes me think, well, you're not, so this is going to extend well beyond screening. These are uh, artificial intelligence oh, algorithms. Yeah. So are we like, talking every body system, nutrition, programming, the whole lot? All what the whole everything that you can think of uh, in health and fitness. So say you guys work with athletic performance. That's what you guys do, right? Where yeah. you work, it's, it's speed, power, injury prevention, performance in the field. That's the essence of what you guys are kind of doing. You guys aren't hypertrophy trainers. You're not fat loss trainers as a primary goal. You may achieve it as a side outcome but you it's not your main objective if you can draw from a whole bunch of data done much quicker than a research project can be done where we're seeing in the real world what all these different people are doing and the actual outcomes that are happening physiologically every minute every second of the day coming in it allows us to streamline the decision making process and the research decision decision process processes so if you can see that cool some gym in um some gym in Melbourne has done trap bar jumps, for example. They've added trap bar jumps into their program. This is a very base level thing. You've added trap bar jumps into your program. You've then got access to some force plate measurement stuff. You guys have seen that trap bar jumps have been, they're the introduction to the program. They're the thing that's made the biggest impact in their client's ability, the athlete's ability to put more force into the ground. We, we can objectively prove that because at the moment we have a whole bunch of ideas. We know that a whole bunch of different things work. This will allow us to quickly figure out what will work best. That's the goal of it all, is to figure out what will work best using real-time data transmission so then we can quickly refine these processes more and more. And so everyone is doing their own mini research study in essence. And then you just collate the data and then make... Uh, uh, the computer makes it, uh, I give the computer the frameworks yeah. to identify which way it works best. So if for hypertrophy, I'm going to use a simpler example. Um, we might find that, because there's so many different like hypertrophy training frameworks. There's so many. Yeah. Like you've got the micros of tells with the MRV type concepts. You've got Mountain Dog, which is like stretch under load and sets to failure, blah, blah, blah. You could literally get hundreds of people doing these type of programs. And you could also then account for nutrition, which is never done in the study because there's too many variables to count properly and literally see where it's going to work. And then using DNA types, uh, phenotypes, all different types, you can then identify what group of people think is going to work faster. So the goal is to always refine what works for people faster and then also in a framework that minimizes risk. Is this like a decade-long process? Is this a lifelong yeah, project right now? That sounds like it. It's a, The screening process is step A, but that's um, nearly finished. It's a, it's a process that will just take longer and longer as I get more and more resources with the company to build and ask more questions, the process never ends, basically. It's a never-ending process. So It's amazing. Yeah, it's it's good. It's like... Keep me I updated. Goal, if you're... I will, absolutely. If a good goal is something that you'll never achieve, if it gives you a purpose, so this is like, all right, cool, I'll never achieve this. I'll never get this right. Um, and I won't ever be able to do it by myself either. I don't pretend I know enough about every training modality to identify it. So it's in finding... I get, I'll get. i also get to work with really good people and like-minded people oh, who will be different. You know, two people to give you... Because you, you're going to have a gut microbiome arm, most likely, and you'll probably have maybe, a I don't know, a biochemistry blood analysis arm too? Definitely. Okay. You may be already familiar, but Dave O'Brien? Yep. Okay. Thank you yep. That's your guy for gut, I think, or one of them at least. You want probably a couple. And uh, Ben Cant, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. Yeah. Uh, well, he used to be training manager for director for RBT. I don't know if he's yes, the name. I don't believe so, but yes, he did. So he did. you're going to have an amazing team uh, around you in the near future. If yeah, not now. that's the plan to work with like amazing people because then I've got my biases in all those different fields um, from my admittedly limited experience. Um, and I eventually want to draw from other people. And then basically the goal of the software will be to prove them wrong or right. Mm-hmm. Like I don't care. I'm not. If I'm wrong, I'm, I'm wrong. I don't care right now because I've got the data. You want truth. Yeah. I don't care about, I'm not actually, oh, four sets or five sets. Well, I prefer four. I don't care. Like, yeah. I want to know what's truth. 
So that's what I want to do with the AI for the book. The book is a very simple project. It kind of based everything that I've done for the last 17 years is essentially summarized in this book. I love that. But it's not a this is how to do it book. I didn't want to give people because if I say this is how to do it, I'm automatically wrong. Because it's not the only way, right? Is that what you're saying? Not the only way. So it's again not not true. Um, it's not it's not te technically right because you can get right, you can get big, you can get strong, you get lean, you get fast. Tons of different ways. What it is, it's more back to what we were talking about earlier with kids. It's teaching trainers a framework for thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's based. It's three parts. Well, the first one's my story, which is amazing, great. Right? It's the best part of the kid. <laughs> um, it's training, three principles of that. Mind, uh, nutrition, three around that, and mindset. The training principles are basic. First one is use the right tool for the job. There's move well to move often, and then individualize. So use the right tool for the job is don't let your biases get in the way. What does the client need? What's to your best of your knowledge at that time? the best tool for the job, for that person's outcome. Uh, move well to move often is a basic intro into screening, but then looking at movement quality in terms of hypertrophy, maximal strength, athletic performance, etc. Basically not demanding a higher standard of movement. And uh, individualization is looking at what parts of the training process are important to individualize and why, because not everything needs to be individualized all the time, particularly with general pop. There's commonalities, but there's and there's things that we know that work, like the right tool for the job, like you know the barbell is probably the best tool for maximal strength, but we still need to individualize some aspects around that. Nutrition, it's no dogma, is the first principle, uh, which is we've talked about that today. The second principle is client-centered coaching, so working with people. The third principle is habit-based and sustainable, so how to actually build habits for people. Mindset, the three principles are, the first one is your relationship with food. Mm. Because relationship with food will also touches on things like relationship with exercise, relationship with different health components. Second one is self-compassion. So how to talk to yourself and deal with setbacks so they don't become dropouts. And the last one is a basic summary of the biopsychosocial approach, but what more used in the context of how do we communicate with our client base and help them with their own unique beliefs around exercise, movement, injury, pain, and nutrition. And that's the book. Wow. Can people, that's that's quite comprehensive, but it's also based in heavy in principles, right? So it sounds Very like heavy. something a lot of people can, like not just coaches can take value from, but like the every everyday person. Yeah. Um, can people pre-order it? Two weeks. Two weeks of, uh, I'm actually building the funnels uh, today at some point. You're right. To order. Well, I'll shoot you a copy anyway. Oh man, that means a lot. Thank you, um, Paul. I was pleasantly surprised by how much I enjoyed this conversation. I didn't expect it to go all the places it went, but um, I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Thank you for having me on, man. Pleasure. Where can people uh, find you, or any last words, comments, thoughts, asks of the audience? Um, if you want to find out anything more for me, uh, Meldrum Performance Coaching on Facebook, Instagram, or website, uh, and add me on Facebook, Paul Meldrum. I think it's paulmeldrum.8. I am very open to chatting to people at all times about this kind of stuff. It's kind of what I do. So I'm open, available, and ready. Awesome, Paul. Um, uh, hopefully, we'll be able to have this conversation in person one day um, when we can travel and when you come okay. next to Melbourne and we can dive into the next steps of what's going on. Awesome, man. Look forward to it. Thank you so much, Paul. Appreciate you. See you later. See you, buddy. You are watching, talking, or listening to Talking Chimps. Do you expect us to behave? Do you expect a chimp to behave in a zoo? And how are you going to expect us to behave? We're in a fucking zoo. It's called the fucking planet. Spinning around in a marble, hurling through space, wondering when the fuck we're going to get off this ride. Never. <laughs> we're stuck. And we're in a Milky Way, which is in another universe, in another universe, in another universe, in another universe.